one try one. Want to make sure everybody's staying dry today. You have that up here. Uh, I want to say welcome. We do have, uh, I think, a great agenda today. I think everyone's going to enjoy uh, the opportunity to uh, gain some insight. Let's see if this works. Uh, let's this up here. So today, I just want to do a, a brief overview because I know that um, there are a few people that sometimes show up that didn't get a chance to come to the prior uh, session. So we want to do just a really brief review uh, of a couple of things that we've talked about uh, before. And uh, then, of course, we'll get into the, the meeting. I'm going to transition to Alonzo Weaver here in just a little bit, our Chief, uh, Chief Operating Officer. And uh, he'll introduce our first speaker. I think it's going to be a great treat for us today. Uh, so first of all, let's talk a little bit as a reminder of what our uh, mission and, and vision uh, and values are, what kind of sets the foundation for what we're, we're doing through this process. Just as a reminder, we exist to safely deliver services that create and sustain superior customer experiences. We want to make sure everyone remembers that as we go through this process. We'll keep that front and center uh, in our mindset. And our, and our vision is to be the trusted provider of exceptional customer value in the communities we're privileged to serve. One of the reasons that we actually have uh, this team together is because we want to make sure that we are engaging the community as we go through such an uh, audacious process as this to make sure that we are considering things that we need to consider as we make uh, some of these uh, bold decisions and your input is just crucial uh, and vital. So thank you for that. And then just lastly, to kind of hit on the, uh, the values that we talked about, safety, which we kicked off with today. Uh, we talked about integrity. That's a big part of what we are, what we are about here as well. <coughs> Ownership, being certain that we are uh, good owners of the assets we've been blessed with. Uh, being inclusive, making certain that we are including ideas and thoughts um, across this enterprise. Uh, and of course, compassionate service as we engage with our customers and other stakeholders. We, uh, of course, call that the MLGW way. So we want to make sure that everybody is aware and remembers that. Real briefly, we talked last time, we met on May the 16th, uh, many of you were able to be there at the White Haven Community Center. Um, we really did a, we had a talk about the partnership, the current arrangement that we have with Tennessee Valley Authority from a power supply standpoint. Uh, I want to make sure that we, if there are questions before we get started regarding the last meeting, of course we can chat about that. I know some representatives from TVA are here today. Um, so we're glad, glad to have them here. They shared, uh, talked about economic development, talked about the power system portfolio. We talked about um, how that has existed, how that does exist, how we're served. We talked about the network uh, arrangement that provides the reliable service that we do currently receive. Uh, we heard from Jeff Lyash, the CEO. You also heard from John Thomas, uh, the Chief Financial Officer for PBA. Talked a little bit as well about the, uh, their forecasting and their future uh, objectives as they went through their planning and their existing IRP process that they're going through. So we spent a lot of time last meeting talking about that. So today uh, we are going to begin preparing us for um, our actual, what I call IRP uh, work. This is, this is what we would call our, our sort of last intro type of meeting beginning in July. We'll talk about that at the end uh, with our July meeting. Uh, we will have our consultant on board. Uh, we'll begin to have, um, your, your work's going to get harder, by the way, by, for that meeting. And uh, we'll begin to have some, um, some in more in-depth discussion and dialogue now that I think you all have had a good foundation of where we are uh, and where we're headed. So we'll be in, engaging uh, with that uh, as, we, as we go. So I'm going to turn it over to Alonzo. Uh, Alonzo's going to introduce uh, our first first. Speaker. Good morning. I'm very morning. pleased to uh, present to you uh, Sue Kelly. Uh, it's quite a treat to have her here. Uh, Sue Kelly is a, has been the president and CEO of the American Public Power Association since April of 2014. Prior to becoming president and CEO, Kelly was APPA's senior vice president, policy analysis, and general counsel. In that capacity, she helped APPA and its members with energy policy formation and policy advocacy before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, federal courts, and other governmental and industry policy forums. From 1998 to 2004, Kelly was the principal with the Washington, D.C. law firm of Miller, Bayless, and O'Neill. She represented cooperatively and publicly owned electric utilities and their trade associations, as well as other governmental entities, <coughs> as 
assisting them with restructuring related issues before the FERC, federal appellate courts, and state public utility commissions. From 1995 to 98, Kelly served as the senior regulatory counsel for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. She represented NRECA before the FERC, state public utility commissions, and courts, and served as a liaison from NRECA to many industry groups. In March of 2008, she was appointed to a one-year term on the U.S. Department of Energy's Electric Advisory Council, the EAC. She served a second term on the EAC from June 2012 to April 2014. In 2010, she was served as the president of the Energy Bar Association. In 2015, she, served, uh, she was selected to serve an associate member on the Commodity and Futures Trade Commission's Energy and Environmental Markets Advisory Committee. She is currently serving on the steering committee of the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Committee, a joint industry government group dealing with cyber and physical security issues. She is also a member of eSource Advisory Board and the Board of Directors of the Center for Energy Workforce Development. Kelly is a frequent speaker on energy-related topics. She has given presentations to many industry groups, including the National Association of Rural Util Regulatory Utility Commissioners, the Organization of PGM States, the Energy Bar Association, the American Bar Association, the American Antitrust Institute, the East Source Forum, the United States Energy Association, the Association of Women in Energy, and the Harvard Electric Policy Group. She's, she's a speaker. <laughs> she has also appeared before federal and state administrative agencies and testified before committees of the U.S. Congress and state legislators. Kelly was named one of Washington's most powerful women in the November 2015 issue of the Washingtonian Magazine in the business, labor, and lobbying category. In March 2017, she was honored as Woman of the Year by the Women's Council on Energy and the Environment. Kelly earned her JD degree with high honors from George Washington University in 1980 and earned her AB degree in honors in interdisciplinary studies in economics, magna cum laude from the University of Missouri in 1977. So I'm pleased to introduce to you Sue Kelly, someone who I've known for about 20 years uh, in this entry. Thank you very much. I didn't know who was going to read the whole thing. <laughs> And I, and my staff and I are kind of like, oh my, you know, the, the, the 
wave is coming at traffic and just on housing, so we're going to be dealing with all that. We've got our own set of issues. You all right? Yes, I'm on the volume for you. Okay, because it's still not working? It doesn't sound like it. How about this? I'm just going to hold it to my ear. Okay. Uh, that's the best I can do. That's the low tech solution. So what is, uh, just as you have your mission and your vision, we have a purpose and a vision. I define the purpose as why my staff get up every Monday morning and fight Washington traffic to get to work. You know, what do they do when they get there? Their job is to partner with our members, including Memphis Like Gas and Water, to promote public power, helping community-owned utilities deliver superior service. The same thing in your, your set. Through joint advocacy, education, and collaboration. We're kind of like the community of community-owned utilities. We're where our members come together from all 49 states to talk about issues and form positions. Our vision, what we want to be when we grow up, is to help you, our members, drive the future of public power, a new era of community-owned service. I am a big adherent of the public power business model, um, as we will get into. But we have some challenges and some new opportunities in the 21st century, and we need to retool our business model to take advantage of those. Leadership and staff. Um, the board, I have a 35 member board that sets my policies, and they come from all regions of the US and the territories. Uh, our 2019 2020 chair, who will become chair next week, is DeCosta Jenkins. He is the CEO of Nashville Electric Service. Jim Farrell from Jackson Energy Authority and Roger Gale from Columbus uh, Light and Water in Mississippi are on our board. So we have a number of TVA systems that are on our board to make sure that the input from the valley is heard. We have 68 staffers back in Crystal City. Compare 68 to 25,000, that's kind of scary, but anyway. We have 68 staffers and we do everything from lobbying, obviously that's a very traditional trade association. We lobby in front of the uh, agencies, we lobby in Capitol Hill, I've testified on Capitol Hill a number of times. I've appeared before regulatory agencies. But not only do we do those traditional Washington advocacy functions, we also coordinate mutual aid after storms. Um, I spent nine months working on mutual aid for Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Um, and actually went down to Puerto Rico to visit our crews who were working there. We coordinated with, along with many, many other people, mutual aid down there. Um, and I'm heading straight from here to our national conference in Austin, Texas, where we'll have 1,300 members there to commune with each other and to think about what are the next steps for our industry. Let me talk a little bit about public power and why I am a strong adherent of it. We've been around for over 100 years in many forms, and a lot of us started in small cities and towns where investor-owned utilities did not provide service because it was not economic for them. We have a for-profit business model. That's the American way. I'm not kicking about that, but the fact of the matter is that means that many areas that were not economical to serve were not getting served. So a lot of my members in small cities and towns across the United States, and some not so small cities and towns, decided that they would take matters in their own hand and form their own utilities. So, you know, as you know, many uh, utilities across the country who do water, do wastewater, are municipal. And so are many of my members providing electric service. But that's how they got their start, was filling a niche. Um, and that has continued today because we have local control. We have no separate class of shareholders that needs to be fed, I guess is what I would say. You know, they, they aren't thinking first about how the shareholders are going to be served and then how do they serve customers. For us, because we are owned by our customers through the medium of local government, it's all about the customer. And that means we have local control of decision making, which is why you are all here today and in the coming months. We also have lower rates as a result of that, generally speaking, and we have higher reliability, um, which, of which I'm, I and my staff are very proud. Just to give you some examples, the average home electric price, in other words, residential rate in the United States for a community-owned utility in 2016 was 11.5 cents. It's 11.8 in 2017. But uh, IOUs are substantially higher in the 13-cent range. Similarly, if you look at our outage rates, public power utilities have lower outages. They restore service more quickly. Um, and then investor-owned utilities, which is the middle line. Now, I will say, um, in defense of my cooperative brothers and sisters, 
because as you heard from my bio, I used to work for the co-ops. They have a lot lower customer density. So, you know, they have like six to seven customers a mile for many of their utilities. So restoring after outages is a lot more work because they got a lot more facilities. So I'm going to give them a pass. But. And we give back to our communities. We give approximately 33% on national average back more than investor-owned utilities do. One of the big uh, raps on us that investor-owned utilities will say, well, say they don't pay taxes. Well, that's true. We're not for profit governmental entities, so we don't. Instead, we pay what's called payment in lieu of taxes or the pilot. That replaces that revenue stream. So we pay pilots to our communities. We also give back in many other ways, including shared services over parts of city government, um, economic development assistance to the city, uh, paying into Christmas lights, you know, just doing all sorts of intangible things to benefit other parts of city government and the community. One thing we don't do, unfortunately, is a good enough job of telling our story. Um, because we are governmental entities, I think sometimes we like to kind of make sure that we're providing service, we're doing our job, if we're not in the news, it's a good day. But that, frankly, I think sells us short because we have so many benefits to the community that we at our association is encouraging our members to tell their story. And one of the things we've done is we've uh, done our own social media campaign called Hashtag Community Power. Um, we did a, a campaign close to the end of last year and we're doing another one this summer. So just urge you to you know, look on your Twitter feed and, and you can check out hashtag community power to see what some of our members are doing on social media. So that's kind of the public power landscape. But frankly, I think you all are undergoing this analysis and this process at a really great and crucial time because our industry is changing very substantially and very fast. There's a couple of reasons why that's the case. First, we're seeing new technologies. Uh, a lot of them are at what we call the grid edge. Uh, for example, you know, residential uh, entities can have a power, a Tesla power wall. It's expensive and it's not that efficient yet, but that's going to improve. You can have a Nest thermostat in your home. You can have solar panels on your roof. You can do all sorts of things technology-wise at the grid edge that really weren't options before. So the, the question for a utility like Memphis is, what do we do with that? How do we incorporate it? We have new competitors that come along with that, new entities that are interested in providing those services. And we have new ways of living. Um, how many of you all have phones where you have apps that you use? Right. How many of you did that 10 years ago? Um, you know, I've traveled, okay, early adopter, extra points for you. Um, but, you know, I'll give you just one example. It's the American Airlines app. I fly a lot. Um, and American Airlines is the, the entity that serves my home airport. So I am forced to be an American Airlines flyer. And I cannot live without the app. How do I check in for my flight? On the app. How did I check last night where the heck my bag was in the Memphis airport? On the app. You know, it's all, that's a level of convenience that we just never had. And people are expecting that in every part of their daily living now. You know, Amazon Prime is going to be going to next day delivery for everything. The amount of back office that takes is pretty amazing to me. But the point is, is that people are expecting that in all parts of their daily life, and they're going to expect it at some point from their electricity provider. So the question is, how do we step up to meet those increased customer expectations? And I, uh, knowing that uh, Tennessee is now a big hockey state, um, I have included a quote from Wayne Gretzky, um, who says that business as usual is not enough. We have to anticipate where customer needs are and move to get them. As Wayne says, I don't skate to where the puck has been, I skate where the puck is going to be. And as I think you all go through that process, you need to think about where the puck is going to be by the time that you're done and in the years coming out. So if you translate that to what's going on in our specific industry, the electric utility industry, right now I think it's safe to say we have a lack of clarity in federal energy policy. The last administration had one set of policies. This administration has a very different set of policies. So we're kind of getting a little bit of what I would call policy whiplash right now. Um, and it's unclear where the environment is going to go. But into, this, into the breach there, a lot of cities and states have stepped in with their own policies. And a lot of those um, cities are my members. 
You know, the utilities are members of those, for example, Seattle City Light, or Sacramento Municipal Utility District, or you know, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the New York Power Authority. They are responding to state and local decision making about where to go on energy policy. And we're seeing more distributed generation, as I said, at the grid edge. Uh, expanded use of new technologies such as storage and electric vehicles, which by the way is a big opportunity for us if we can figure out how to capitalize on it and how to uh, get people to charge at the time we want them to charge. Uh, and smart meters and smart grid technologies that enable us to understand much more quickly where outages are and respond to them. And as a result, we're having more industry players, as I've noted. The other thing that's important to note is that in many regions of the country we're having flat or declining load, which is one of the reasons why pursuing new loads like electric vehicles and residential heating and cooling is really very, you know, kind of enticing. Because as you have increasing energy efficiency from appliances and increasing building codes, you know, new houses being built out that's more efficient than old housing, you know, per customer usage is actually going down over time for residential. As I noted, customer expectations are increasing. There's a lower tolerance for outages than there used to be. I'll give you one example. I live in North Arlington, um, a pretty high-end community of very entitled people, if I may say so myself. We have a, net, we have a listserv called Next Door. How many of you all have a Next Door listserv? Okay, you, you know all about it. That's the, that's the temper of your neighborhood, right? <laughs> We, a couple, about a couple weeks ago, we had a bad thunderstorm in the late afternoon and it had a microburst where this major wind came through and took down a major, you know, distribution line along one of the main highways in Arlington. So they had to shut the road and about 30,000 customers were out of power. And within three hours, there was a thread on, on my next door entitled, D Dominion Power is a uh, failure. That was the title of the thread. And I thought, wow. You know, and there were 44 replies within a very short period of time. Now, I'm thankful to say that some of those replies said, well, you know, it does take a little while to restore. And, you know, they are probably doing hospitals and schools and other vital facilities before they get to your particular cul-de-sac. You know, that kind of thing. But it just shows you how people have just become very, very dependent on electricity and very, very indignant when they don't have it. And that's something that we have to think about. Reliability is incredibly important. I think that many of my members are making new investments to make the grid smarter as a result so that they know where the outages are so they can respond more quickly and make it more reliable. And here's, uh, it was mentioned that I'm a member of the uh, Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council. That's an industry government group that deals with cyber and physical security. I've been on it for about three or four years now. And every meeting of that group, I leave more distressed than when I came in. I can't talk to anybody about what I've heard, but I get really, really upset. Um, and cyber and physical security is an increasingly important issue that everybody's going to have to just build in. Just like the culture of safety that you have here at Memphis Light, Gas, and Water now, like, you know, the safety announcement that opened this meeting, you're going to have to have that, that cyber culture inculcated in all your employees, too. That's something we really need to work on. And then we have workforce turnover, because our industry skews old. We've got a lot of baby boomers in both the electric utility industry as a whole and in public power. And I stand before you as Exhibit A. I am retiring at the end of the year. I want to go while I'm finishing strong, but I am a baby boomer, and there's a lot more like me in our industry, and we have to figure out how are we going to replace them with the skilled and dedicated employees with the skills we need for this next century. And then there's a low level of knowledge of, by the public about what we do and how we do it. And I would go back to that listserv entry. You know, you expect your power on three hours after an entire line you know, was taken down. People don't understand what we do or how we do it or all the intricacies that go into providing service. So, you know, they don't really think about it. And that can result in some unrealistic expectations. And frankly, one of the things I hope comes out of this process is a greater appreciation by the citizens of Memphis of what they got and what it takes to make that happen for them. Um, 
um, and to make sure that as they move forward to make new decisions, that they do that in a thoughtful way that makes sure that reliability and affordability and environmental sustainability are maintained. What we're seeing is that commercial and industrial customers are increasingly wanting more green and sustainable energy supplies. Uh, there was a, a trade press article this morning about Starbucks, which is entering into three different renewable uh, portfolio projects in three different regions of the United States electrical grid to, in theory, help you know, power their, uh, their Starbucks shops with renewable energy. Um, there's a lot more behind that, and if you, you know, start looking at those claims, you have to think, well, you know, really, is that wind power going to be, you know, even when it's not blowing, are they powering that Starbucks? Probably not, but the fact of the matter is, is there's a lot more interest in renewable energy supply. Um, and more of them are installing distributed generation at their facilities, including entities like Walmart. How many of you all have a Walmart near you? <coughs> But anyway, they are very big into doing uh, more energy efficiency at their stores, doing distributed generation at their storage, doing electric charging at their storage. They're very, that's part of their corporate sustainability goals. And what I'd like to see is I'd like to see public power utilities be partners with our customers in this effort. You know, we can do this for the benefit of all our customers if it's done right. If it just happens piecemeal, and each one of these customers is pursuing their own economic and you know, uh, social goal and advantage, it doesn't necessarily add up to a better result for all the customers on the system. So if we can be involved in that, and we can help make sure that as that's done, it benefits all the customers on the utility system, that is a good thing. And in, increasingly, residential customers are going to want to use technology to control their usage. Uh, but the nest, reduce their bills, or are interested in energy efficiency. Uh, I'm waiting for the day when they say, you know, Alexa, pay my electric bill. You know, um, that's going to happen at some point. We need to make sure we have the back offices that are ready to do that. Um, they're going to want to invest more, at least ones that have more resources to do this, to invest in more like, on-site storage or on-site uh, generation of their facilities so they never experience an outage. The Washington area is one of those areas. Um, we have some upper income neighborhoods up in uh, Maryland where our uh, investor owned power supplier, Pepco, which had a reliability record in the lowest quartile of all utilities for quite a few years, they just went out and bought gas fired turbines for their houses. And when power goes out, they just fire up the gas fired turbines. And of course, everybody else without power has their windows open and they get to listen to them. And, you know, that doesn't go over well. But, you know, just saying that there's customers who are like, I'm not going to tolerate that outage, and I have money to invest to pre prevent it, um, and they're going to. Same thing in, in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy, same thing. So they're going to take matters into their own hands. And again, we need to be partners with them as they do that to make sure that these investments, you know, don't really come at the expense of other customers. We need to make sure it's benefiting everyone. So the challenge for us, as I've said, is to up our game. We have to anticipate and manage these changes and partner with third parties, because you know, can't always do it by ourselves. We need to partner with third parties with expertise in these specific grid edge technologies, software providers, just you know, all sorts of technology providers. And that requires new investments and new service offers. So public utilities, like my members, like Memphis, are gonna have to decide how and when to invest in these technologies what kind of services they're going to offer, and make sure that all customers' interests are represented when that's being done, and that the investments that are undertaken benefit everyone. And I really think that our, I've seen as I've traveled across the country that each community has this conversation and decides what the values are for it, and then they implement accordingly. So some utilities, I've got members on the left coast that are way down the road towards 100% renewable and trying to cope with what are the fallout of that. Um, how do they maintain reliability? How do they keep the cost contained? But, you know, and other parts of the country have slightly different emphasis. That's one of the purposes of talking to groups like yours and to the public as you go through an IRP is what is most important? How do we balance those interests? So we have to figure out where we're going. That's our job one. 
We have to figure out how much do we care about the affordability of service? How much do we care about the reliability of service? How much do we care about environmental sustainability and carbon reduction? How much do we care about economic development? Those are all things that kind of go into the wearing blender of an IRP, figure out what to do. And when the needs are competing, as they can be, how do you reconcile them? Where do you draw that line? As I know, there is no free lunch as you go through this. You know, if you're going to make new investments, those have to be paid for. If you don't make new investments, you're going to pay as well in many small ways and then eventually in big ways. So that's a, a question. So this gets me to IRP, the topic of the morning because this is the primary tool that a lot of my members use to figure out those questions, the answers to those questions that I just posed to you. You know, we as public power utilities have an obligation to serve everyone in the community. We can't say we're serving this customer and not that customer. We have to serve them all. That is our job, that is our mission. And we undertake it gladly. We have to take care of in the in front of what I call front of the meter functions that enable service to all those customers. But to help us figure out how best to do that, we engage in what we call integrated resource planning. It's a periodic planning exercise with community input to determine what our future needs are, what our values are, how we're going to meet future demand, what are the cost constraints, what's the optimal resource portfolio. And a lot of times you retain an outside consultant because a lot of this is really fiendishly difficult. And in the case of Memphis, from what I've read so far, it's going to be especially difficult. There's, a, there's not only the regular IRP issues, then there's the issues of our transmission investment to work go with that. So that gives you an additional level of you know, Star Trek chess that most people don't have as they go through this process. So what are the common kind of threads or features of IRPs? You have to balance reliability of service, cost, and environmental sustainability. Different communities place different emphasis on these three items. And again, use people like you, and public meetings, and social media, and online surveys to try and gauge that. Usually happens maybe every five years. Um, sometimes they have interim updates to that. And then you look out into the future for a substantial period of time, could be 10, could be 20 years, but of course, everybody knows that that last period, that last five to 10 years, who knows where we're going to be in that amount of time. So you have to have a grain of salt when you get out to the later years. And what you do is you run a variety of scenarios, possible different futures, and possible different policy goals, and, and then different what we call portfolios. And that will be discussed, I believe, more later this morning. Um, when in preparing for this, I actually asked my staff, to get me the executive summaries of a bunch of different public power IRPs. So I spent this weekend looking at different IRPs, and it actually is fascinating because it really does, it's a microcosm of each community. For example, um, one of our larger members is Salt River Project. They serve in Phoenix, Arizona, a desert environment. They also provide water service. Um, and when they figured out what were the, what were the uh, kind of scenarios they were gonna study, the ones they picked were the breakthrough scenario, which was high-tech implementation and CO2 limits, so that they were going to have to use more and more technology to deal with how to deal with CO2 limits. Then they had their roller coaster scenario, which was, you know, the economy was up and down and up and down and up and down, which, of course, they really took a hit in the 2008 kind of economic um, unpleasantness. That's the word to use there. Um, and they definitely... Um, you know, they were hit by that, they've come back, but what happens if that happens again? That's one of the things they wanted to study, was the impact on demand. And then they had their desert contraction scenario, which I thought of in my mind as the Mad Max scenario, um, where you had drought, you had high temperatures, the environment became less sustainable, people actually moved away. You know. So I thought that was interesting that they chose to study that. Then the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power I mean, they have been told that by the state and by the mayor that they are implementing carbon regime. And the question for them is, how best to do that? And one of the questions for the LA Basin, which as you know, is famously smog filled, and they need to address that, is how much of the carbon reduction should come from the utility, and how much should come from other sectors, like transport? And the relative cost of getting reductions in carbon from the utility versus the relative cost of getting reductions from transport. 
in, you know, as you go out 5, 10, 20 years. So they were studying a bunch of different scenarios that had you know, different emphasis on different sectors. Some of the variables that they looked at, SRP, for example, is talking about reducing coal. They're closing a large coal-fired power station called the Navajo Generating Station. Um, they looked at energy efficiency. How much can we replace with that? Reliance on natural gas is a way to back renewables. Mm -hmm. What about battery technology? Um, and they have a share in a big nuclear plant, Palo Verde, and the question was, do they continue that, or at some point will that go away, and if so, what do they replace it with? And hydro, which as you can imagine, that the ability to uh, rely on hydro varies based on which scenario. If it's a drought scenario, there'll be less water, there'll be less hydro. LA was looking at what is the level of the renewable portfolio standard that we're going to be expected to meet. How much do we want to do with solar in the LA basin? Um, how much energy efficiency? And how do we get what they call dependable capacity? Capacity which they knew would be there to back other um, resources that are not as dependable. Colorado Springs, they've got a big coal-fired power plant right in the middle of downtown. I mean, right in the middle of downtown. So a lot of their IRP was built around, you know, when do we retire that, on what schedule, how do we replace it. So they were looking at, you know, for example, small modular nuclear reactors as a way to get reliable base load in some out years. Or new coal with carbon capture and storage. So they were, you know, looking at a, you know, blue sky and a lot of different ideas. The outcome of this process provides policy guidance to utility staff. They need to know what their marching orders are. They need to know what the community cares about. They need to know how to proceed um, with their resource decisions. They need to think about what kind of generation, what mix of each type, what investments have to be made to support them. Um, and in this case, it could be very substantial investments to support a new generation. How much to develop it depend on the demand side. In other words, how much can you do in your own community through energy efficiency, through uh, uh, distributed generation to, you know, to impact what your overall needs are? And how much do you do on the supply side? And of that supply, how much is local in the community and how much is remote? Um, it's what we call central station. So I will say, um, I'm gonna about ready to close here, but I, I, I have some random observations Based upon my homework assignment this weekend, I thought I would share with you for extra credit. Um, first, the communities that I reviewed vary widely on the emphasis they place on greenhouse gas reduction, which you would expect. You know, my membership has both red and blue states. Um, where it is paramount, then you have to consider how much of the reduction comes from our sector, the power sector, versus how much from other sectors, the building sector, the transport sector. Um, Higher costs due to reducing greenhouse gases under those scenarios can be offset by new loads. You know, if you're making new investments and you have more units of sales to cover those investments, then you know you can prevent an increase in cost. But if your costs go up too fast, then you kind of kill the golden goose. Who's going to want to do electric vehicles if the cost of charging up is the same as gas, right? So you have to. There's a uh, some of the IRPs are you know how do we balance those factors? A few more observations. Portfolio diversity, which means diversity of types of generation and of supply and demand side, has value. Uh, because the more you, eggs you put in one basket, the more you're reliant you are, and the more you can have a single point of failure. It's like a 401 kit. You know, you wouldn't want to put it all in commodity options. You know, you need to have a diversified portfolio to get you to retirement. Energy efficiency measures. Some of my members said, you know, we're going to put that in the IRP plan and we're going to do that, especially with low income customers, even if it doesn't pencil out as well as some other options, because we understand how important that is in the community. And, you know, that's something that our community cares about. We found that out during the process, so we're going to do that, even if it might be the cheapest option. <coughs> Pilot projects are a great way to test out things that you might, you know, want to do in your next IRP. Say you're interested in going big into electric vehicles, we'll do a pilot during this period and then take the results of that and use that to inform the next period. And while some, I saw references to small modular nuclear reactors in some of the IRPs that I reviewed, I didn't see any utility studying the option of a big traditional style nuclear plant unless they had already contracted to purchase that output. So just noting that for you. 
Um, my final message to you is if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. But that's not a good idea for a public power utility that's owned by its customers. We need to know where we're going. We need to know what the values of the communities are and what your preferences and priorities are and then construct an IRP that takes those into account and develops the possible different scenarios and features that will get you where you need to be in terms of reliability, affordability, and environmental responsibility. And as I say, for each community, that conversation is a little bit different, and that's why it's important to have it, and that's why it's important to have an organized process to do it, and frankly, an outside expert who can inform with their knowledge of what other communities have done and their knowledge of the industry. So, that is the end of my prepared presentation. Um, do we have any time for questions? Okay. So I'm happy to take any questions. I understand that my panel is, the horseshoe is where my questions are supposed to come from. Yes, but uh, tell me who you are. I'm uh, Dennis Lynch, I'm with the Sierra Club. Okay. Um, en energy co-ops are part of your organization, but no. no. Now, how do you compare and, and why, what are the pluses and minuses? Um, of the business model? Yeah. Well, I can answer that. Um, electric co-ops are not for profit like we are. They are owned by their customers directly. In other words, if you are a customer of the co-op, you are a part owner of the co-op. Uh, here, in our model, it's done through the medium of local government. Um, one of the differences that that results in is what we call government in the sunshine. As you know, governmental entities operate you know, as an open book. Our meetings are open. Our records are open. Um, and that actually, in some respects, while it makes life more difficult for the management sometimes, uh, it also makes it much more transparent what they are doing. So, um, and we've had some recent examples of co-ops. For example, they just passed a statute in South Carolina uh, because there was one co-op there that was highly non-transparent. Um, and, you know, they actually had to address that through state legislation. So, each model has pros and cons, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I, I am a fan of consumer-owned utilities, both varieties. But I do think that public power, because it is owned through the medium of local government, has the requirement to be transparent, to be open, and to operate in the sunshine. And I think that, frankly, is a benefit. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I am sticking around till 2. So if anybody doesn't want to ask me a question in public, I'm available for five minutes. Thank you. And I also want to thank Sue for making a bit of a detour to join us today because in her travels and trying to get to a uh, meeting in Austin, she sort of had to do a little bit of, uh, make some changes to get here to be with us and share some of her expertise. And like she said, she'll be here until um, the end of the meeting. So certainly we have a chance to interact with her and engage with her um, as, uh, as needed. So one of the things that uh, we were going to talk about today that I want to make sure everyone's aware of uh, or remind us we, we talked some um, early on about some studies that were done for, uh, on behalf of uh, a few entities that um, we have. Now, quick question, uh, where are Alonzo, Frank? Are we, the, the studies themselves, what did we do? Did we post those on the website? Yes. Okay. So everyone should be, everyone, any, not just those of you on the PSAP, but everyone should be able to have access to the studies that, uh, that were provided um, to us. And so uh, for the bulk of the rest of today, we'll spend some time really stepping through uh, some of the elements um, of those studies. And we have some folks from our staff that's gonna step us through that, walk us through that. And I'd ask that you, uh, if you haven't paid attention to what those studies talk about, I'd ask you to stay engaged. Think about what you heard uh, Sue talk about and think about what we've talked about in our first couple of meetings uh, regarding this process and where we're headed um, as you think about the, the studies and then as you compare that to this process and the end result of where we're, uh, of where we're headed. So we're gonna, we're gonna transition and take some time to walk through it just as a, as a uh, 
a matter of note. Um, do we tell everybody what the restrooms were? And everybody know where they're? Do, do we do that, Frank? Okay, you did that earlier. So we're going to try to do this. This will this will take us through lunch, and as we've done before, we'll we'll take a break and do the working lunch thing. So uh, probably as you all are talking about this part, we'll actually at some convenient point take about 15 minutes, let you know, a transition, get lunch, and then then y'all can finish up when we do that. So we have Rod Cleek. Uh, Rod is our uh, rates and budget. Uh, really financial manager who's going to uh, step us through this along with uh, Reggie Bolin. Reggie is our op What's your title, Reggie? Systems, Systems Operations Manager. Uh, Reggie and uh, both of them and their team spent a lot of time um, as we as we delve, delve into those, those studies to sort of think through what some of the requirements would be uh, and what's necessary elements as we consider uh, things that are going on. So we're going to actually um, we're going to actually have them to step through this for us and actually walk through each one. Feel free, of course, to uh, interject, uh, ask questions for clarification, and again, you'll be able to access all these from our, our website. So I'm going to turn it over, I think, to you, Rod, first to kick us off. Do you have a Better. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to lean over as much as I can here. Uh, sorry, I had to make sure I get my notes up here for me so I can uh, go through the presentation. Uh, Sue said she's a baby boomer, is that right? I'm a Gen Xer, okay, but even though I'm a Gen Xer, I still have to write things down. Um, I'm getting to the age where I forget, so I'm always uh, trying to write my notes down, and it reminded me of the story. Uh, there was an elderly lady and an elderly, her husband, sitting out on the porch, and uh, she turns to the husband and she uh, asks the husband, she says, I sure would go for a big bowl of vanilla ice cream with some chocolate syrup on it. And uh, the husband said, okay, I'll go get you something. But she said, you better write that down because you're going to forget. So the husband goes in the house and he uh, goes and comes back 20 minutes later. He has a uh, plate of scrambled eggs and toast and he hands it to his wife and she says to him so i told you you should have written that down you forgot the bacon all right um so first of all let's let's come up we're going to talk about various terms and, and uh throughout this presentation and some of these studies and so i just wanted to Kind of walk you through some of the definitions of these terms. Um, the first one is uh, MISO. So you've heard us talk about MISO in uh, the course of probably the first few uh, presentations that we've done. So MISO actually stands for Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. And so MISO is one of the larger, what's called an RTO, a Regional Transmission Operator, uh, just to the west of us in uh, west of the uh, Mississippi River. So we're pretty close to them geographically. Their territory actually runs from all the way up into Canada, all the way down to the, the Gulf of Mexico, um, the border of Louisiana and Mississippi. In terms of size and capacity, they're about five to six times as big as uh, TVA is in terms of capacity and generation within its footprint. So if you hear us uh, refer to MISO, that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, the other term that we're going to be talking about a lot is capacity cost and energy cost. And so if you think about capacity cost in your own uh, world, you might want to think about that as like a car payment. Uh, the capacity cost of a generation unit uh, doesn't vary with the output or the electricity that it produces, uh, similar to like a, a personal car payment. 
you're going to make that car payment regardless of how often you use that uh, car. Same thing with like insurance. So you know, those are two kind of examples of uh, what a fixed cost or a capacity cost might be related to uh, generation. Uh, the energy is much different. So energy cost does uh, vary with the amount of consumption that's produced by a generating unit. So personally, if, going back to the car analogy, it's kind of like your gasoline that you buy. So you, as you drive more miles, your gasoline and cost of gasoline for you uh, would uh, increase proportionately with the amount of miles that you drive. Uh, similarly, an oil change is kind of like a variable O&M related to your car. So you try to get your oil change to you know, three months or 3,000 miles. So that would be like a variable O&M component. It's kind of different from the fuel component. So when we talk about energy costs, we're going to talk about both the fuel cost component and potentially the variable O&M associated with generating assets. Heat rate is another term you're going to hear. Um, it's a fuel efficiency metric. Uh, it's measured in BTU per kWh. You go, oh my goodness, I can't, there's so many of these terms. But BTU is British Thermal Units and kWh is kilowatt hours. So BTU per kilowatt hour kind of just gives you an efficiency. So it's kind of like back to the car analogy, it's kind of like a miles per gallon. How, how efficient is this generating unit uh, uh, compared to others? The other term you've heard us refer to is balancing authority. Um, so the balancing authority today in this world, we, don't have, we do not have to worry about what our demand is relative to supply. So some TDA acts like this for MLGW right now. So if you've ever seen kind of a system operations environment, there's somebody that's sitting in front of a terminal watching the demand go up and down and it's trying to match that with supply resources up and down and they have to do that in real time. So it's a 24 hour a day operation that somebody has to do. So that's kind of what a balancing authority is when we uh, talk about the studies later. And the last one is a pseudo transmission tie. Um, so this is, this is a uh, transmission access that's not necessarily physically tied into uh, uh, an environment. You'll hear us talk about this related to MISO. Um, you know, we, we do not have a, Melody Debbie does not have a physical tie into MISO, but there can be a pseudo tie uh, that, that's through maybe TV there or another engine. All right, so the first study that I'm going to talk about is the ICF study. Um, this is the uh, nuclear development study. Um, ICF is a very, very large global consultant that's uh, based out of Fairfax, Virginia. It's uh, essentially out of Washington, D.C. Have a very large uh, global presence, uh, not only here in America, but in other countries. Um, so this study really focused in on uh, a power purchase agreement for the output of the Bellefonte nuclear plant. Uh, it also involved having MISO integration uh, that we talked about. I will say this, that of all the studies that I looked at, the four studies, um, this particular study did do probably the best job at a uh, transmission analysis. Uh, it was partial transmission analysis, uh, but it, it, it did address that significantly. If you read the studies, you probably kind of can uh, hone in on that. Um, the best scenario of all the scenarios that uh, ICF presented was MLGW joins MISO, it purchases Bellefonte uh, Unit 1 power, and then for the incremental uh, power needs, it would actually have a physical hedge to cover uh, those incremental power needs actually from the uh, MISO area. The uh, total net savings over the 20-year period that was presented was about $7.9 billion. <coughs> The period that it looked at again started in 2024, and the reason for that is it assumes about a five to six year uh, build out period that's required uh, for the Belfont plan in conjunction with uh, the five year notice that we would uh, need to give TBA to, to move forward with something like this. Uh, just to, in, to put the 7.9 billion in context, it's about 40% uh, power cost savings per year. Um, and so that was the, uh, the best scenario uh, in the ICF study. So the thing I want to emphasize to you is that all of this, even all of the scenarios that we'll talk about, hinges on Belafonte. And the ICF study itself, there's a quote in there that talks about its scope didn't include the analysis of all the costs that might pertain to being able to get Belafonte up and running and online and uh, unit commitment as far as Belafonte's concerned. 
Say what physical heads is. Uh, physical heads, we would actually enter into like a contract with an actual uh, uh, physical generating supplier over in MISO. That's kind of what that physical hedge is. You said it did not include something in your very previous sentence. Uh, the, the study itself, yeah. the scope of the study itself, did not include a cost analysis related to getting Bellapont up and running. So, you know, Bellapont, we'll talk about this in just a second. How much would it cost to get Bellapont up and running? You know, is it even viable? It did, the study didn't cover that side of it. We'll talk about the, the uh, rate um, that they were proposing here in a second. So just a little background on the Bellapont plant itself. Um, so TVA began constructing these units. There's two units that they began construction on in 1975. So I'm a generation Xer, um, and um, so I was two years old uh, when they began construction on this unit back in 1975. Uh, the initial plan was to have two additional units, so there were to be about four units there at the Bellapont site. So you can see there on the on the right hand side of the page there, there's an actual aerial view of uh, the Bellapont plant. Those two big things that are sticking up, those are actually cooling towers for the water uh, related to the two units there at Bellapont. So just to kind of put how, you know, what's the size of these Bellapont units uh, that were to be constructed. So units one and two were designed to be about 1,350 megawatts. Um, and our peak load at MLGW is about mm, 3,200 megawatts, give or take a hot summer. Um, so that, that one unit, the 1,350, only represents about 40% of MLGW's peak. Um, so um, the average load for MLGW is actually about 1,600 megawatts. So it doesn't even cover, on any average hour, it doesn't cover the complete needs of our system. Um, in 1988, TVA essentially halted uh, any meaningful construction around uh, the Bellapont plant after about six billion dollars worth of initial investment um, and there was a significant incident that happened in 1979 does anybody remember that i was only three mile island. six years old so uh three mile island somebody said it over here so three mile island i believe it was in pennsylvania uh, had a nuclear uh, uh, meltdown there and uh, so that incident really ramped up significant regulatory actions related to nuclear bill outs and so i put a little snippet of the, a New York Times article from 1994 that talks about uh, all of the various nuclear plants uh, that were underway. It says there was almost 100 that were in various stages of construction and, and there was already $30 billion that was spent uh, related to nuclear, and, but they were shuttered. And so TVA has kind of fell in line with uh, a lot of that uh, that was going on in terms of uh, you know, the, the halting of the nuclear uh, construction. So there was significant impacts to the nuclear industry uh, because of uh, Three Mile Island. Um, so just a little bit about a nuclear plant. So you just, you kind of wonder about, you know, what's the cost of a nuclear plant? Um, so, so nuclear plants themselves have very, very high initial capital costs. Uh, one of the industry standards that you go to to kind of look at, hey, what is the, what is it, what would it cost me to build my own nuclear plant or even a, a gas plant or some other type of plant? Uh, Lazard is a consulting group that puts out annually uh, what's called a localized cost of energy uh, study. And their most recent study that came out in November of 2018, you can go out and Google this for yourself, you can get it publicly available. Um, the estimate for the construction cost, an overnight cost for a, a nuclear plant, is about $6,500 to $12,250 per kW. So just to put that in perspective, in today's dollars, that, that yellow uh, Bellapont unit would cost about $16.5 billion uh, on the high end. 
Now, as Sue just mentioned to you, um, there's, there's really not a lot of build out in new nuclear plants. There's only two that I know of that are almost finished or, or right there, and that's the Vogel units that are in Georgia. I don't know if you've been following those two units in the news lately, but there's been some significant cost challenges and delays related to getting those plants online. I think one of them is almost online. But the cost estimate for those two units alone is $25 billion. Those two units are about the same size as the Belafonte Unit 1. Um, but so you're, you're talking about you know, 12, $12 billion uh, a piece for each one of those units. But on the flip side, nuclear plants have a very, very low uh, variable cost or low fuel cost. Um, so when you build a nuclear plant, because they have very low fuel costs, you always want to run them all out. So you want uh, 87, 60 uh, hours of runtime for them. So that's generally how you, how you run a nuclear plant because the variable costs are so low. Uh, in a nuclear power plant, uh, the uranium-235 is uh, the fuel, the fuel, the fuel rods for the nuclear plant. We talked about heat rate. Well, uranium-235 is about 85 cents per MMBTU, and at the heat rate of about 10,250 DPKDH, we're talking about less than one cent of uh, fuel cost related to a nuclear plant. So you say, well, how does that compare to like a combined cycle of natural gas unit? So a combined cycle uh, natural gas unit, if you had about $4 gas, $4 per MMBTU gas, that would equate to about three cents per kilowatt hour. So you're comparing three cents of a natural gas fuel rate versus a little bit less than one cent for a nuclear rate, nuclear fuel rate. Um, so natural gas is about three times uh, higher in terms of uh, just the fuel comparison only. Um, questions? Questions? I don't think that. Lazar's study uh, handles the cost of handling uh, spent fuel rods after their, their useful life. Is yes, I think they, they admit that in the study that they have, and so there could be some uh, consequences of what to do with the spent fuel uh, after you, uh, you know, build the nuclear plant. That's a good point. Somebody else had a question? You know? That was all. All right, so back to the Belafonte unit. So the Belafonte unit, the price used in every single one of these scenarios that we're going to talk about here shortly, has a price in the study of $39 per megawatt hour. Okay? So in our Lazar study that we referenced, a nuclear all in cost range uh, for an overnight build is about $112 to $189 a megawatt hour built overnight today. And so back to, you know, why would you ever build a nuclear plant? Because combined cycle of natural gas units, just for comparison, an all-in cost range is about $41 to $74. So you can see from those two numbers why nobody is building uh, new, new nuclear plants across the country. So here's the timeline, a little bit about the timeline related to the Belafonte plant itself. Um, so you've seen, if you've read the study, you've seen the FLH company uh, reference. Of course, that uh, gentleman's name is Franklin Haney. Um, he, he's the owner of that particular uh, organization for whom the study was done. Um, so in November of 2016, um, that company, Franklin Haney, won a bid auction with TVA uh, for the Belafonte nuclear plant and the site. And they essentially were given two years to consummate the sale of Elephant. Um, so two years later, in November of 2017, um, we came to the date of being able to close on the sale. And as I understand it from reading news articles, TVA said, uh, wait a second, we have a problem. Um, I believe the problem was related to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the sale of uh, nuclear facility to an individual and so uh, right now the uh, actual sales transaction is in federal court um, that little snippet up there is an article from uh, May I believe the 17th or 18th um, but you can google the news and you can see the latest on uh, where the Belafonte sale transaction is in terms of uh, the, the latest moves 
Um, if the sale is ever finalized, uh, the FLH company would finish out, has plans to finish out just unit one uh, in the short term, and it might take, according to them, five to six years to build out, and then subsequently they would look at finishing uh, unit two uh, sometime later in the future. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that the plan has been sitting idle for 45 years. So if you take 45 years, you add five to six to seven years, you're talking about uh, a unit that's, that's 50 years old that's, that's been sitting there. So here are the scenarios that were presented in the study. Um, options <coughs> uh, related to just continuing kind of with TVA as is. TVA would act as a balancing authority we talked about. Um, we would, though, uh, have to enter into some type of partial requirements world with TVA, which doesn't exist right now. And uh, then we would have a purchase power agreement with Bellapont for the uh, $39 uh, a megawatt hour. So again, all of these options, all of these options included Bellapont unit uh, being built in the next five to six years, being priced at $39 a megawatt hour. So just keep that in mind as we continue this discussion. Um, they did hone in on option 2A as being the best option, uh, which involved us uh, joining MISO. MISO would be the balancing authority for our load. And as we talked about earlier, uh, we would have a physical hedge inside of MISO for uh, an asset, the output of an asset to meet our incremental power needs. Um, each one of these uh, options were uh, priced out over 20 years and compared to what they call a business as usual case. The business as usual case uh, actually priced TDA out in time at about a 2% compound annual growth rate for the period, uh, the 20 year period starting in 2024. So here are the savings summary numbers. Um, the uh, option 2A that we mentioned it actually produced a savings of about $384 million. That's a levelized savings over time. So kind of, you know, all the year savings were kind of brought back to a levelized number uh, in the year 2024. Um, that's, you know, roughly a 30% savings from uh, uh, the TVA benchmark that was in the study. Uh, again, a little bit about options 2A, we kind of mentioned this. Uh, the key thing that I do want to point out is the third bullet there at the bottom. Uh, it says MLGW builds transmission lines to interconnect with MISO. So this is very important. You know, as we talked about, or, or, we talked about throughout all of our uh, different uh, meetings that we've had, is that the key to a lot of this is involved in the transmission system that we have. And then not only would we build those lines out, but we also secure transmission rights uh, with MISO. So let's keep that in mind. So here, here's a little snippet out of the study itself that talks about the uh, transmission line construction. And so if you see this uh, over here on the left-hand side, this is kind of a picture of, we've talked about our four delivery points that we have. We have Shelby at the north, Cordova out east, Freeport down at the south, and then Allen there on the western side of our, of our system. So, you know, right now we've got uh, a great kind of physical arrangement around the entire kind of system, if you will, for delivery of electricity. And this particular option that they focused in on, if you see the points there on the left-hand side of the Arkansas and uh, uh, Tennessee uh, border there, there's two points that are highlighted. Uh, one is called Driver and the other is called West Memphis. Um, according to the ICF study, uh, TVA has actual uh, transmission lines that are already, there's two of those that are connected uh, so somehow into Driver or West Memphis. But they focused on uh, MLGW building another line that would tie the Shelby in the North Point over to Driver, uh, across the river into uh, the Driver area and then also from the Freeport uh, delivery point in the south all the way across the river to West Memphis. So that would involve two new uh, single transmission lines uh, to be constructed across the Mississippi River. And at the bottom in the table, you can see they actually took a shot at uh, estimating the cost related to those transmission lines. So if you see that a little highlighted, you, you may not be able to read that, but 
it says it would need a total of about 80 uh, miles, 80 miles of new transmission line to be constructed, and the cost estimate that they have is about $400 million. Okay? So that was incorporated into their, uh, their numbers and their analysis, uh, and so they did, they did think a little bit deeper dive into some of the transmission issues that we might have uh, related to uh, getting power over into the, to the system. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, how is Belafonte going to be connected to MISO, I guess, because they're at the bottom of the key years? Right. So what they're proposing in uh, the study is that Belafonte's power will be wheeled through the TBA system. So that's something I kind of jumped over that I probably haven't mentioned. Is that it kind of assumes that MLGW would be able to easily get transmission access through TBA to be able to get the Belafonte power to uh, MLGW. That's a good point. Big assumption. Required by law to do that. Um, we, that TVA is uh, has an open access tariff out uh, filed with FERC, and so um, I'm not a lawyer, but I mean I think there would be some issues around uh, being able to secure the transmission. Uh, number one, TVA will want to do. And, uh, probably a transmission study themselves to see, you know, the impacts of trying to flow power from Belafonte around the area. And so they're going to want to do a transmission study. They're going to want to probably, you know, figure out what, what it costs to get that power and fit. And whatever that cost is, they're probably going to be looking to us to help pay for that cost uh, related to any improvements to their system and transmission um, that might be needed to get that power from Belafonte to MLGW. That cost of the study number? Um, I'm not quite sure if that deep of a dive was done by ICF or not. I think the assumption was, from what I read, is that we would easily be able to get transmission access from TBA. Uh, Dennis. Uh, hasn't uh, TBA cannibalized some of the components of the Belafonte plant to keep some of their other nuclear? plants operating, number one. And number two, uh, didn't Haney quote a price that had some real substantial wheel room in his price quote? The, to your first question, I'm not I'm not certain that TDA has cannibalized parts from Belafonte for use in other plants. I'm not sure that. I, I have read that the uh, Belafonte Unit 1 has been, there was significant almost completion <laughs> to the Belafonte Unit 1, I want to say it was probably um, like 70% complete. Um, but to, the, to your second point, I don't believe there, the $39 megawatt hour price included uh, any transmission because that's going to be on us to deal with TVA to be able to wheel that power uh, through <coughs> TVA to MLGW. Yes, ma'am. Two questions. Uh, this seems to assume that the uh, Haynes scenario um, will be sufficiently capitalized to do what they need to do to get that plant up and running. And after 45 years, do we expect that those numbers will be higher to be able to do that? That's the first question. And the second, and let me let you answer that. That is a fantastic lead into this slide right here as far as the capitalization of that plant. Um, I've seen estimates in news articles about what it might cost to build out that plant uh, that probably range from, you know, six billion to ten billion uh, in that range. Um, but this second bullet up here on this slide kind of speaks to your question about how good is this thirty-nine dollar a megawatt hour price. So, I, you know, I went back and just did some kind of quick math. If you use kind of a uh, the Lazard cost, or even if you said, let's just say that price to finish out Belafonte cost about $10,000 per KW to finish that out. Um, even at a 0% cost of capital, that means that's acting like money is free. Okay, we all know that's not true. But even at 0% cost of capital, you're talking about $53 a megawatt hour as a cost. So in my mind, I'm sitting here going, how in the world can this $39, you know, be, be legitimate? So, uh, you know, so that's kind of to your point. Um, so, you know, you sign an agreement, you know, maybe, you, maybe, you know, he can 
maybe someone can uh, stick to $39 a megawatt hour for a short period of time, but in the long run, somebody is going to get the return on investment for that money. It's not going to be zero, and so um, I just kind of have a, have a little bit of a issue with the $39 a megawatt hour. And you have a second question. Yeah, and so how many of the options effectively address capacity increases long term? This particular study, uh, it just primarily focused in as if the $39 is going to be locked in for the whole period of this study. So, you know, this particular study didn't focus on, you know, capacity cost increases over time. Ron? Yes. If MLG and W contracts with MISO, why do we care where the power comes from? I, I presume. What MISO does is they aggregate power from many sources. Right. What's the, what's the connection? In terms of if you just said I want to go to MISO and I'm going to buy in the spot market, you're going to be exposed to whatever the daily price swings are. And so, what you do generally is you don't ever, you never ever generally want to be exposed to just a spot price in a market. So, you know, you know what most people would do is they want some sort of a hedge. And so when you're looking for some type of physical asset to maybe contract for a purchase power agreement to be able to kind of firm up, you know, or to give you some protection about price swings uh, in, a, in any given market. Just for clarification, that means MLG and W is contracting with somebody supplying the power and all my son does is deliver it? Yes, that's correct. So aren't there like dozens and dozens of sources because how many cities does MISO serve? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a huge lot. system, and uh, there's about 63 uh, balancing authorities that are in the MISO footprint. And if you read through the study, one of the interesting things that I, you know, I think a lot of this is going to boil down to is, you know, cost of capacity. And uh, right now in MISO, and you can go out and read various studies, but in MISO there is an abundance. Right now, there's an abundance of capacity out there, to your point, uh, that can be had at relatively uh, inexpensive prices. And uh, so that's kind of the situation we're in right now. So what you've seen over time, this is I'm kind of chasing, going down a different path, but you've seen, as, Kel as Sue Kelly uh, mentioned, loads, loads for utilities are kind of dropping off. And you know, probably 10 years ago, we had a significant build out of natural gas fire uh, combustion uh, combined cycle and CTs. And so there's, uh, there's kind of an oversupply of capacity uh, in the market, you know, across the river. And so that is, to your point, that is uh, the case there. So, but that would be, that is an option or not? It could be an option, but uh, as far as like just being exposed to any, type, any particular spot market in terms of even just the capacity, you probably don't want to do that. Uh, don't just, these communities contract long term with, with reliable? Yes. yes. Yeah, and, and, and to the point, and we'll get into this a little bit later today, I think, too. So I'm getting ahead of myself. No, you're, no, no, it's a good question, but I think we all need to kind of remember uh, part, the part of the reason we're going through this is to sort of demonstrate that in, individually these studies had an objective on their own, each one, and they came from a perspective. And so what we have to keep in mind is kind of what we've been talking about in the previous meetings as well, is this, this nature to be comprehensive, right, and think about risk and issues that don't necessarily reflect themselves in the study. So it's exposed, as Rod says, the concern, the thing we have to think about is we would be going into the MISO market with no, gen we have no generation, right? So we have no, today, we don't have a physical edge to say we have to either contract or construct uh, because typically what happens is you go into that market, you bring something with you um, to deliver. But you know, we got we today would be going in there completely undressed because we have nothing to offer, and then we'd be subject, as, as Rob says, to those swings that uh, could be pretty significant depending on what happens. And so, when you're, you got to be careful when you look at those average costs uh, for energy. When you're not certain what's going to happen next winter or this summer, you have a day or two that takes you completely out of money in one one or two days for the whole year. So you have to think about what that requirement would be. And we'll talk about that in fact later today. We'll do a little bit more on that that I think will help. All right, just uh, 
back to this issues for consideration, uh, the first issue that you need to think about is that you've got a significant portion of your load tied up into one single unit. So you have to think about the risk of what happens if that unit goes down, uh, does the power, you know, does the lights go out, what are we gonna do? If, and they, ultimately, they gotta take the plant offline for some maintenance, so at some point you've gotta think about that and the risk there. Um, we talked about the economics there and the uh, issues there. Um, the other thing to consider is the timing. So if we said, you know, hey, yep, we're in for that, and, and the FLH group has to build a, uh, a, new, a nuclear unit, build that nuclear unit out, they got to do it uh, in five to six years as we've given notice to TVA. So, you know, in the meantime, TVA is probably redoing their integrated resource plan, and they're taking MLGW's load out of their uh, load forecast, and they're probably going to start uh, maybe sh shuttering some more coal units or doing something essentially to TVA. We're gone. And so uh, the timing of when all that happens is out of our control. It's uh, out of our control because that plan is to be built. Um, the other issues are the risk that we've mentioned and talked about the, the sensitivity analysis around prices and uh, unit availability and load forecast. A lot of the studies uh, that you'll see today didn't really do a lot of uh, sensitivity around loads. Matter of fact, a lot of them have our loads kind of growing on a growing path. Um, so, you know, in general, when you do sensitivities, you'll kind of have a high and a low and a medium and things like that. And so what, what would it look like, you know, if MLG is low, the teams to kind of fall off, what would that look like? So those are some issues that uh, full-blown IRP will, will uh, provide for us. And again, but if I could leave you with one thing, I want you to remember that this study, the entire focus of this study is around that one unit. So all these scenarios assume that Belfont unit's working and never goes out. It's $39 a megawatt hour for the entire uh, the entire period, and it also assumes that TVA's prices are going to compound uh, grow at about two percent per year. <coughs> so, uh, with that, I'm going to probably uh, any questions related to the ICF study. Uh, real quick, you said it at the beginning, but how much was unit one and unit two going to have your capacity for? Uh, unit one was about 1,350 megawatts, and unit two is about the same size. So both of them combined don't cover our units. So that's exactly right. So we still got a risk factor there. Yeah, right. If, if you could, um, I'm going back to the bell fund. So on the front end, let's say, would they be with the proposal that they're talking about? That 39 is on the front end. What I mean by the front end, let's say that they, they estimate the cost to be, to, to get it up and running, to be eight billion. Well, if it turns out to be 10, how does that affect that 39? It's a fantastic question. The study doesn't really even talk about that. I mean, it just assumes that price is fixed at $39 a megawatt hour. And as I illustrated to you and talked about that, that number, it just it does not make sense viewed in my head how that price can be sustainable at the level of capital investment that it's going to require to uh, bring that unit online. Um, so I, to your point, it doesn't really address that. Uh, if there's cost overruns, it seems to imply that you know somebody's going to eat that, which you know we all know that's probably not. So at a 54. <clears throat> and a 54 number, what would that translate into these projected savings that they have? I don't have that number with me, but that 54 just came from me um, kind of calculating what I thought that number might be. So. Okay, so let's go back to the 39. Mm -hmm. That 39 still would not include what would be if we're able to, for lack of a better word, piggyback off of the TBA transmission lines to get here. So that's an, addi is, that's an additional cost, is that correct? Right. That's right. Okay. So I'm okay with that. Let's go into MISO, say, take Belfont off. We strictly go to Belfont. And I'm thinking about the, uh, well, we strictly go to MISO. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about that slide that you had about driver and West Memphis. 
So those costs right there were just four hundred million dollars estimated, correct? That's for the study four hundred. Okay. Yes. So what would be helpful is that if we, in the scenario that I always think about is the Allen fund that we have right now, that was a billion dollars spread across eleven million people. So I'm thinking about four hundred million dollars spread amongst. 430, does that have any customers? 430,000. So those still would be cost borne by a much smaller customer base. So if we can have, what would be helpful to me is if we can translate those costs to kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, that 400 million, once we talk about that, those fixed infrastructure costs that would just be borne by people in Shelby County. So, so the intent of the study back to it is that, you know, we would only build the, the lines to tie in if it was more advantageous to us economically than just wheel and power through MISO and TPA and all that. So, you know, per the study, it's more advantageous for us in the long run uh, to go ahead and build those transmission lines and avoid kind of the transmission costs associated with MISO and TPA. So there's a, there's a payback there, you know, uh, is in the study, is, you know, uh, you know, the, the reference savings was about $384 million a year. You think about a transmission investment of $400 million. So you know, that, would, that would be paid, paid back pretty quickly in terms of that particular investment. Um, so that's kind of the way they're looking at that approach. Is it's, it's the least cost way to get the power years to go ahead and try to build the lines across the river to tie in to MISO and avoid the transmission ruling costs in the long run over that long period of time. Hey, Rod. Yes, I just want to make one point. Um, their their whole uh, study is based on bringing Bellafine online. Every single one of the options includes Bellafine. And to quote their report, uh, it says ICF assumes the Bellafine One project is completed by 1 1 24 and sells its full output to MLGW at a rate schedule of starting around $39 per megawatt hour. Goes on to say <clears throat> that their scope does not include a review of Bellafont One's project costs, performance, and feasibility. So the basic assumption that flows through all this is the $39. So if that's not true, the whole argument falls apart. Well, one other thing I'd add too, uh, that 39, so we're at that 3.9 3 cents, basically 4 cents. That still goes back to roughly about 5 cents that I came up with when we're at Whitehaven, when we take out what the debt service is on the rate that we're getting right now from TVA. So we do have that, that set fixed cost right now outside of debt. So any type of overages would just be added on to that four cents that we're talking about here. We are already at a five cents in some change. All right, well, we're going to transition into, yeah. okay, we're going to go to a, yeah. 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 Thanks, Ron. Let's do this. Um, just from a timing perspective, uh, you want to talk about the break? The sure. Okay. Well, I feel very good on the schedule right now. So what I want to do is, for the PSAT members and MLG and W guests, we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. One thing I do need from the PSAT members, if you have not completed your conflict of interest form, please see me doing lunch so we can get that completed. Lunch will be right here, uh, out the door to the left. Again, the restrooms will be down the hall to the left if you want to go ahead and go to the restrooms. We're going to take about a 15-minute break before we transition into the other studies. Okay? We're coming back in here. We're coming back in here. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Linda Williams, Wise Foundation. Uh, Dennis Lynch, Sierra Club, a local chairperson. Emily Robertson, Greater Memphis Chamber. Jim West, Vice President, Chief Customer Officer at NLB Dennis. And JT Young, President and CEO of NLB Dennis. I also want to acknowledge uh, from an elected official standpoint, we do have uh, Councilwoman, the Vice Chair, Patrice Robinson, is here with us. Anybody else? Any other elected officials? Okay, I think we're good. All right, great. Is this your show? Let's keep on with our uh, agenda. We should be good today. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to Rod's presentation. A lot of great questions, too. Uh, i like a couple points in this presentation. Uh, you saw the cost of the ICF didn't make a stab that the cost of transmission is roughly $40 million, 80 miles, you know, half a million dollars a mile. Uh, we're in the transmission business. Uh, we haven't seen half a million dollars a mile. Uh, me speaking, I think that's quite close to $80 million. So this is a rough thing. And also, there were some questions on the Frankie. Can you speak up or move closer to the mic, please? Is that it? I'm a little taller in the room. Is that better? That's better. I clean over this far. Uh, also, I'm going to just grab this thing. I don't want to do Okay. Can everybody hear me now? I'd rather just walk around for the day one. Uh, as I was mentioning, the cost of transmission, the ICF made a study to stay at that, and I think it's probably low, probably twice as bad amount. Also, there's some comments about price volatility. Uh, we saw prices last year upwards of $1,000 a megawatt hour for a brief amount of time. So, we talk about our hedging, all these future studies, about some amount of hedging, physical hedging, uh, purchase power agreements. So just to let you know, there is a wild swing in the market. But we're going to go over GDS Associates. Uh, Seth Brown is here. He'll be the first thing afterwards. This firm did this study. It was commissioned by MLG of W. It was as a result of the ICF study. That's what kicked everything off, the ICF study. We kind of look at that study in general and uh, look at some uh, other options for MLG of W. So what we did, we did an analysis of the power purchase agreement that I took to develop on. We did it both with and without MISO integration. Also, some to the Belafonte unit at $39 per megawatt hour. That was what the ICF study produced, so we wanted to look at that. We're going to look at four scenarios. We'll kind of get into all those in general. Also, in this study and all the remaining studies, there's no transmission analysis in any of these studies. As soon as the transmission is there, it's an energy only uh, analysis. It uses a levelized cost of energy. It's not intended to say this is how much it's going to cost to build generation and build transmission. So it's energy only analysis. Uh, we'll go over the most economic scenario they came up with, which is us to own our own balance authority and be tied to MISO, MISO purposes only. And identify the savings, and this is really a one year study, identify the savings of $417.8 million. And the recommendations came out of this, which is where we're going is the uh, integrated resource plan. Okay, so the whole thing was to look again at the evaluate long-term supply options and also the Belafonte project. And again, as I say, this is an energy-only model. It just looks at the cost of uh, production cost of energy. Uh, it evaluate both us as standalone and integrated into MISO. We include a 15% renewable wind portfolio. And note that this study and all the other studies compared to TDA's wholesale power agreement cost. Uh, so you really got a little baffles and oranges there because people will say, well, this is the cost of energy without any capacity cost, without any transmission cost, this cost of energy. We have TDA, you know, because we have TDA's wholesale power agreement cost with us. So it's, it's a little apples and oranges, I think, in all this interpretation stuff. All right, GPS used a large footprint that contained low generation and substation level analysis for us. You're going to hear this ProMod thrown out quite a bit. ProMod, ProMod is a production uh, cost program used for modeling. 
it's an industry standard. Most everybody uses it. If you're here at ProLog, you'll see that in a lot of different studies. Also use the latest MISO database, 2042. It captured uh, unit cost, transmission congestion, and load cost. What is transmission congestion? <coughs> that comes as a highway. You drive to work every day, you come down, you get that flyover. What happens? It might all the cars try to feed into one spot. It's got a lot of congestion. This thing right here will look at congestion. It's got too much power trying to close the two few lines. It takes that into account. Also, uh, looks at some TVA's business usual case. And which includes, there's another clue capacity cost. Remember, TPA is the all in cost. And so these were the four scenarios we're evaluating. Scenario A, MOG does its own balance authority and belt line. As Rod mentioned, the balance authority means we're responsible for matching our generation to our demand. Everybody comes home at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the demand goes up, we're responsible for looking at that on a real-time basis, increasing the generation, and bring more power to serve that load. Right now, TVA supplies that for us. Uh, Belmont's delivered to MLGW through uh, firm point-to-point transmission. Uh, we'll talk about that. It's probably through the TVA lines. we we'll through the TVA. And also, uh, we would hold a firm point-to-point transmission from MISO. Loss of belt line because you got to realize belt lines gonna have to come down. They got to refuel. They might have to take it off the line. So if they took it off the line, they got to get that power somewhere else. So we have to have some uh, force pump transmission from my side. Scenario B was uh, MOG and WN as its own balance authority. Belt line, and this time we built some self drill resources. We built some combined side of generation and uh, had that as our hedge. So right now, Belfont's delivered to MOGW through point-to-point -point transmission, and then we hold non-firm service to MISO for sales and purchasing, and we have to sell for those resources. Scenario C was MOGW and MISO with Belfont. Belfont's delivered to MISO through firm point-to-point -point transmission, and we hold a firm point-to-point -point transmission for our peak load with uh, MISO in the case of loss of Belfont. And scenario D is we're wide open in the market. We're totally in my side. We're buying off the market, all costs. That's something, something they would never recommend we do. As a matter of fact, most of the studies say they would never recommend that you just buy completely off the market. You've got to hedge. So I mentioned the price cost at $1,000 for maybe one hour. I have, I have a question on the scenario. Yes, sir. The again, would, on the scenario D, would MLG and W have to be on the balance and authority there too? Oh, just on scenario uh, A, A and B, okay. my son would be our balance of authority. If we join my son, we would, they would pick up TV as well. Okay. Can you talk about what the personnel <coughs> obligations are or what the personnel costs would be if we, if we looked at a scenario A, if we had to bring it out? Well, that's part, that's, that's, part what, that's part of what we've asked for in the RP. We've okay. asked for the RP to study our, not only our change in our business culture, our change in our personnel. And also just the resources we have available in terms of our gaming, which is our you know, control uh, equipment. You know, do we have everything we need to do, all the software, everything we need to do. So hopefully that study will provide that for us. Okay. Thank you. All right, what I did is that one to each one of these in detail, I just wanted to bring up the uh, scenario cost for each one. Now as again, TVA's wholesale power cost, you know, these other scenarios uh, don't include all the costs earned in those days. They don't include the self field generation. They don't include any kind of transmission ties to MISO. It's strictly energy costs. So uh, scenario A uh, up through D. D was the wholesale market. Kind of shows you what the cost of that power would be. Of course, scenario B is something that you would never want to do. I know the price looks good, but you would never want to do that scenario. So it does show, though, that there's some good people saying this would be Uh, Belfont costs are well above market energy prices in some gas scenarios. They, they quoted $39 per megawatt hour. <coughs> At $39 per hour, several, uh, there's several periods during the year where they're higher than what you can purchase off the market or maybe what you can generate yourself. So there's what we call a price taker. I mean, the only time they can really sell that power is when the market is above $39 per megawatt hour. We enter into a long-term contract with them. $39 per megawatt hour, we're essentially locking ourselves into that price that, that maybe sometimes in the year we get a cheaper rate. So that's something we have to look at. All right, the uh, 
put the comparison of the MISO scenarios, the D minus C, and show the $200 million difference. Uh, spoke about the new efficient thermal generation, that's just built on the combined cycle plant, and that provides hedges against market prices. And energy markets offset low cost. But it does require significant capital investment to get per about a million dollars per thousand megawatt plant program. Uh, the one scenario they got ruled out was purchased strictly from the market. It does provide opportunities for low cost, but there's no protection from scarcity in the prices. So, you know, if you try to buy something, you lose it. Somebody loses some power, we need some power to come in, and it's sitting there in July, the time of the year. You want to buy wherever the market's going to sell, and that right there is going to be good. So here's some uh, risks that we're citing with the Belafonte project. The uh, design of their, their uh, Belafonte project is a reactor design I don't believe exists anywhere else in the TPA. I don't think they have the technical expertise to do that. There's not many of those around. So, uh, also, a lot of the original vendors no longer existence. So, you know, just buy the parts for it. It's all about your reverse engineering. It's pretty much a non standard move. Um, like detailed engineering analysis of existing plants and equipment, uh, use of guaranteed uh, product <coughs> contract with penalties, says the contractor's schedule delays may be under no risk. And also, they're progressing from what they call fuel load to commercial operation for three months. That's a pretty tight time frame. That seems to be under risk. And also, just the ability to hire and train operations. Operators are familiar with the uh, weaker plant. There's not many of them out there anymore because you know, we haven't been doing that business for a long time. Right. So, what the recommendations were were to obtain the TPA, the incremental cost of energy capacity, ancillary services, conduct a discovery session with MISO. As you, as you go into this with MISO, MISO will perform a detailed assessment. Because what they're going to look at, do they have the transmission, enough transmission to even serve us if we tie into them? And they're going to look at our again. So, you know, you, they would do a detailed transmission analysis. <coughs> uh, again, they would do identifying transmission transfer limitations. Uh, there are some limitations. There's some upgrades we made. Variety of mentioned we would want to bear that cost. Uh, then again, it's GS recommendation, the MLG and WPC, which is developing a complete integrated resource plan. That's the whole purpose of what these uh, will hold our study. Uh, so we have a 20 year period, the MLG and on net present value basis, we identify the most cost effective resource portfolio with its over capacity and year requirements. And that's where we want to go. That's the purpose of our thing. All right, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Rod. Any questions for me? Yes. Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, scenario D with MISO, how is that different from what we currently do with TBA? I think scenario D was just a market, all in market scenario. <laughs> that, that's not a scenario where we actually contract with MISO. For no, that's, what, no that, that's just all the It's just open, open, open market. market. Got gotcha. an open market. Mine was cheap. <laughs> So this particular study was a bit different in flavor. Um, the bridal group study was uh, done for a organization called <coughs> Friends of the Earth. So as we look at the numbers and look at the portfolios for this particular study, you're going to notice a significant portion of the generation resources are renewable in nature. Um, significant focus on that. But there also is some MISO integration. Um, with this particular scenarios that are done because you're going to hear about uh, imported renewables such as like wind and solar uh, into our territory. There were uh, six alternatives analyzed. The way they kind of did this particular study is they did three scenarios in year 2024 20, uh, and then they did three more scenarios way out in time in 2050 uh, and the scenarios way out in time uh, we're primarily 100% focused on renewable or essentially getting to almost what I call a, a carbon-free portfolio of generation to meet our uh, load. Uh, there was no transmission analysis, no deep dive uh, like uh, the ICF study earlier. Uh, they just assumed that transmission was um, 
available there and sufficient to be able to wield the power that we'll talk about earlier, the wield the renewables through MISO to our footprint. Um, and that, uh, that particular section was on page 25. They did kind of talk about their, uh, their uh, recognition, if you will, of uh, the transmission issues that we're going to have as it relates to wheeling uh, renewables to our system. The uh, <clears throat> most economic alternative uh, that was mentioned was one that we'll, we'll see here in a second called cost minimizing local. Um, what that involved is uh, almost MLDW uh, as an island. Uh, we would uh, own some generation, all of our generation inside of our territory and meet our uh, demand just with the generation assets here uh, in Shelby County. Um, the identified savings related to this uh, cost minimizing local scenario was about $333 million per year in year 2024. And so the recommendation of this study was to end our contract with TVA and construct a portfolio of renewables, battery storage, and also natural gas powered uh, energy. So the Friends of the Earth, uh, this group is headquartered in Washington, D.C., uh, really focused on reducing the greenhouse uh, gas emissions, reducing your carbon footprint. So just took a snapshot uh, from the website and you can see that they're very environmentally focused there. So just briefly, we mentioned the six portfolios um, and the third bullet here is the one I want to kind of emphasize that again, there was no model construction of uh, new transmission uh, but and we're going to talk about some of the uh, importing of wind and solar uh, from in particular from the western uh, region of MISO into our uh, footprint to, to meet our demand. Again, the, uh, what I call by MLGW as an island scenario is the, the minimal cost portfolio that they presented. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and jump right into this chart. This chart may be a little bit difficult to read, but we talked about the 2024 portfolios that were designed. Uh, over on the left hand side of this chart, um, is there a pointer on there? Okay. Sorry. So over on the left hand side you can see this these are bars of uh, installed capacity. Um, over here and over here is the cost of all of those portfolios. Um, so what I want to draw your attention to there first is in the cost minimizing local that gray bar there is natural gas fire generation. It's comprised of 1,800 megawatts of combined cycle units, 1,400 megawatts of combustion turbine. So if you, the difference between a combined cycle and combustion turbine is that generally a combustion turbine is more thought of as a quick start uh, unit that can be turned on very rapidly. Um, they're usually used at the very peaks of de demand uh, periods. Uh, to be able to get a unit online quickly to meet that demand. Uh, so you're, you're talking about in this particular scenario on the left, far left, that's about 3,200 megawatts of uh, natural gas supply. So you know our current load right now, the peak load is about 3,200 megawatts. But in addition to the natural gas, uh, you can see the at the bottom there in kind of the red red color there, that's a uh, local solar. So that might be some form of uh, utility scale solar. I know that TBA and doing their most recent IRP, uh, any type of new uh, generation uh, that may come online in their IRP might involve some uh, form of utility scale solar because of the uh, prices are coming down with uh, solar generation. Um, and then at the top of that cost minimizing local bar there on the far left, you can see there's demand response and energy efficiency at the very top, and that's about 500 uh, megawatts of, of that particular uh, generation, or not generation, supply, supply side option. And the uh, two subsequent bars kind of layer on uh, more renewables, if you will. So there's a portfolio called the local RE, which is to the, just to the, in the middle there on the left-hand side. Um, what's going on there, along with the higher RE bar to the right, is that they're adding on more layers of wind. So in this particular two portfolios, uh, the, the dark green bar there at the bottom, uh, on the third, the 
third bar there is imported wind. So right there, imported wind. So that would imply that we are wheeling power from a wind supplier uh, through the transmission system, in particular MISO, because MISO is probably uh, is the, is the majority of where a lot of wind power comes from. And so uh, we'd be wheeling uh, wind power in in those particular scenarios. So you can see at the top, uh, there's the percentages of the renewables as a, uh, in terms of uh, total generation. So 3% in the uh, cost minimizing, so the cheapest cost <coughs> in this particular scenario, only 3% of the generation will come from renewables. Whereas in the high renewable portfolio, you're looking up to about 32% of your generation, uh, your kilowatt hours are coming from renewable sources. So over here on the right hand side, you'll see the cost uh, for those particular portfolios. So in the bar right here on the uh, cost minimizing local, the top of that chart, I know it's hard to read, but it's about five cents. So their cost minimizing uh, portfolio would come in levelized at about five cents per kilowatt hour. Moving to the right, if you add on the uh, little bit slice of uh, more renewables, it goes up to 5.6 cents per kilowatt hour. And if you add on a little bit more renewables, you get up to 6 cents per kilowatt hour. And then if you're able to sell any excess renewables back into the market, it kind of offsets that 6 cent cost there on the far, the far right bar there. And so the total cost of that bar is about 5.7 cents. Uh, per kilowatt hour and all of that is compared to that top red line which is uh, their projection of TBA at about 7.5 cents per kilowatt hour so that's kind of a comparison of the cost of the 2024 portfolio so the main thing my main takeaway from this is that their cost minimizing portfolio involved a significant portion of natural gas so going forward in time, Dennis. Those are all inclusive MLTW costs, including additional personnel to operate. They they took a shot at estimating some of those costs. I'm not going to say they're good or bad, but they did in the study talk about the need, you know, in that particular scenario, if we're local, just like Reggie said, you know, we become a balancing authority for our own load, so that involves a whole lot more costs in terms of personnel and expertise and all that. Um, but to Dennis's point, I think they did take a shot at that um, and including that in their uh, particular model. But right, S somebody else had, like I said, uh, this report did not include transmission costs, correct? That's, that's correct. But what, what they did, it doesn't include the cost of constructing any new transmission. So um, they, the assumption is, is that transmission is sufficient over in MISO to be able to wheel power, however the electrons flow, we would have transmission costs associated with wheeling the power through the various transmission systems. And it was adequate, power would flow, there was no problems. Uh, you know, when, when, you do, when you try to do transmission, there's always uh, load flow studies that are done to see if there's improvements that need to be made in order to get the power where you're going. Um, but in that case, they did not include anything like that. Someone else had a question. Let me say. Are there suppliers who deal with battery, combustible <laughs> turbines, uh, imported solar, local wind, imported wind? I mean, that's a lot of various and sundry uh, forms of power that need to be delivered. So if MLGW has responsibility solely for doing that, that's going to really create a lot of structural uh, growth issues in the organization because you got to have the capacity and the expertise to be able to know how to manage all of that. Exactly, and that's why we're down this IRP path is to help us to navigate those complex issues related to, hey, you know, do we, how much wind do you want? And so, and that's exactly why we're going down this IRP path. All right, so this next scenario is kind of what I call a carbon-free uh, portfolio of supplies. So they go out in time and, and, and make the assumption that in uh, 2050 uh, we would be able to have generation assets that are all uh, mostly renewable. And you can see how the colored bars kind of change to uh, significant, all, or essentially all renewable. There is a 
there is a gray, that little gray slice there is still a uh, natural gas uh, unit uh, that is still as a local presence here. Um, but the majority of the supply that you're seeing up there is renewable. The uh, red shaded bars in those charts are solar, uh, both local and imported. The imported is the dark colored red. And you can see the significant portion of this load is really imported wind. And so the assumption, the difference between these two bars here is the bar on the left assumes that the wind is being contracted for from MISO, okay? So uh, there's a significant uh, capacity, wind capacity over in MISO. Of course, most of that wind is kind of in the northern part of MISO, up towards the Minnesota area. And so you're going to have significant uh, transmission costs to be able to say, hey, I want that wind and I want to ship down here down south. And so there's going to be significant transmission issues related to that. Over here on the right hand side is the cost again, laid out similar to the previous chart. So the far left of that chart is the Western renewable portfolios. Uh, the first one is uh, coming in at about nine cents. The uh, second one, assuming that you can sell excess renewable uh, energy that you have under contract, uh, would reduce that to seven cents. Um, in the Eastern renewable portfolio, that assumes that the majority of this renewable portfolio is coming from the <coughs> Eastern side of the United States, in particular they mentioned uh, Tennessee. Um, but I'm, I'm not familiar with a whole lot of wind uh, that's coming from Tennessee area, but it could come from another area. Uh, but you can see in the eastern renewable portfolio, which is those uh, third and fourth bar, uh, the cost of that is about 8.8 .8 cents. And then if you could sell excess into the market, it's 6.5 it's 6 cents. They did, uh, the other thing I do want to go back and talk about just briefly is that uh, you can see this bar over here on the left hand side, this axis is the capacity size. And you, you do notice that the capacity in this 2050 model uh, for MLGW has jumped to almost 11,000 megawatts. Um, so that's about a 200% growth over that period. Uh, the one thing in the study that it did mention is that it assumes that there is a 50% penetration of electric vehicles in our market. So it would be a 50% penetration of electric vehicles in the market. So the, the, the demand over here is significantly more than, than we are seeing today. Um, and this last chart is, is like a 2050 picture of if we had all mostly natural gas, just as a comparison back to kind of similar to the previous chart and the cost minimizing local, which is comprised majority of uh, CCs and CTs. And that particular cost is uh, 5.4 cents uh, per kilowatt hour all in. So this particular portfolio is kind of a carbon free look. You know, what if MLG we could, could use all renewables in uh, their portfolio? Uh, in summary, the range of savings for the bridal study was about 240 to 333 million uh, compared to their TDA projections. Uh, you know, they depended heavily, uh, especially the cost, the minimal cost scenario, uh, depended heavily on uh, natural gas fire units, uh, and they would all be here locally built. Um, no need for any uh, transmission or anything uh, as regards to the cost minimizing local. And the uh, percentage of the portfolios in the near term kind of ranged from 3 to 26 percent, and then in the 2050 portfolios, uh, it ranged from 89% to 100% of renewables. The one thing I did want to note uh, in terms of the financing of these uh, particular capital assets, I did notice that some of the assumptions were that about 50% of any of the capital costs required uh, were only financed with debt. And so uh, it, just, it just assumes that the uh, interest cost only apply to about half of this portfolio. Um, and so the other, the other funds would need to come from uh, some other source like current revenues or such. So that's, uh, that's my summary on that one. Anybody have any questions related to the bridal study? So my question is, um, this one seems to be more focused on environmental concerns and reducing carbon. 
a little more rapidly than the other scenarios were. I didn't notice that we talked about the environmental impact of any of the others or reduction in carbon footprint based on you know all the other proposals. So was there any recognition of that and did any of them speak to the whole reduction of the carbon footprint? Um, to my knowledge, the only one where we, the only study where we particularly said, hey, go do this, was in our own GDS study, study where we kind of included a, I believe it was 15% wind uh, request in that particular portfolio. But that's, that's kind of why you need to do an RP because RP you have the ability to say, okay, let me look at this kind of portfolio that might be, have this kind of asset in it. So that's the very reason why you go down this path is to, Make sure that you get that portfolio where you want it to achieve the results that you want. All right, thank you. We'll turn it over to Rick. Try this again. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this study was conducted by the ACES Power Marketing Group. They're a uh, uh, group housed in uh, Carmel, Indiana. Now, the purpose of this was to stu uh, again to study if uh, MFEW should um, consider self-supplying its electric electricity needs or stay within TVA. They analyzed 22 separate portfolios, probably the most of any of them in the studies. Uh, again, no transmission costs were included, no upgrade costs were included. And they derived that the most economic portfolio was 7% uh, purchase power from MISO. 51% was a purchase power agreement through some entity. They didn't mention one for just a market purchase, a long-term contract. Uh, that we would self-build 900 megawatts of combined cycle and that we would build that here. So, and then again, that we purchased from the market 25% uh, of solar and wind combination. And then we would also self-build 650 megawatts of what they call quick start, quick start peaking. They identified a savings of $9.2 billion over 15 years. <clears throat> and they recommended that we get the MISO again, as I mentioned earlier, they do a full assessment of transmission capabilities between MISO and MLG&W. All right, I'm gonna point to this chart. This is one they used uh, to come up with their cost analysis. And we'll, Something good or bad, they had MLG and W, the self supply rate, at a relatively flat for the next what, 15 years or 20, 15 years, 20 years. This they had a relatively flat, maybe of less than 1% growth. But they did a sensitivity analysis on TVA at a 1% rate or a 5% rate, and they settled in on the solid line, which is not mentioned in the report, but it's a 2.1% rate. But they only did the sensitivity analysis on TVA's prices fluctuating. They didn't also do a sensitivity analysis on our prices fluctuating. So they kept us relatively stable and let TVA fluctuate. Like, you know, the RP is going to get both of those. The other thing that I noticed in the study, which uh, I'm not sure exactly why, but if you notice on there, 2.1% their solid blue line, they went from about 80 to maybe $100 million. But if you go through the entire study, every other slide uses a graph more from like 80 to $120 million. So I don't know if it's a graph area or just if their data corresponds to 2.1%. But this graph is 2.1%. That's the only time you see it. And then the other graphs seem to have a steeper curve. But without access to the data, I'm not sure what they're comparing to. These were all the scenarios they went through. They said 22. They used a bunch of different iterations of just uh, combined cycle, renewables. Everything came up with the final portfolio down there at the bottom. And we'll just go back to this slide right here. This has come back to, again, we go 7% market access, we buy power off the market. The 51% base load supply, that's just a, a long-term power agreement, somebody purchased power agreement for some entity. Intermediate supply is 900 megawatts of combined cycle. The combined cycle wouldn't run all the time, it'd run when it's cost efficient for us to run it. So I think people think we're gonna bring in a combined cycle plan that's gonna run all the time. It's not, it's gonna run when the market dictates it. And that's what we have to look at. Uh, renewable supply, we purchased again 1,000 megawatts of solar, 500 megawatts of peaking, and then we'd also have to build 650 megawatts of quick start peaking. Quick start peaking is very inefficient and only runs by less than 10% of the time. 
You only run it when you actually have to have it. Summer peak, got to bring something on real quick and run it. You know, something that you just almost put the switch and there it is. So they use a uh, portfolio 22. They did a very good job though of going through the report building each step one, what we do, step two, step three, and they kind of went through a pretty good process on that. But in this example though, we, we have to build about 1,550 million watts of supply. So again, um, uh, their strategy focused involved joining the MISO market with a bunch of layered hedges to sell supply, sell build, and purchase power agreements. They also did a pretty good job of setting a step-by-step -step outline for each portfolio. And the portfolio was projected to say 19.2 billion or the average it out for 15 years, 613 million. But again, I'm not quite sure that's compared to the 2.1% curve, curve or the other curves they were talking about. They had a lot of many if needed comments, like if transmission is needed, if this is needed, if this, it's all needed. You can just scratch through that if needed stuff because they put a bunch of needed transmission or needed this. And, it's all we need. They have a lot of needed stuff. All right, their recommendations was to contact MISO to complete an assessment uh, regarding the transmission, if needed, uh, which will be needed because we don't have time to MISO right now. And conduct an RFP from the availability cost of the base load thousand megawatts. <coughs> and this is the only one that really referred to some questions about that been brought up about our skills to acquire outsource. <laughs> yeah what would we need to do internally? So there was a, at least a comment to address that we would need to do that. All right, any questions on ACES before I summarize that? Yes, was this was a study that MLTW commissioned, right? No, sir. No. Who, who paid for the study? I think ACES came to City of Memphis. Unsolicited? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought they came to City of Memphis. Yeah, we, we did not solicit. They're in the business of bubbling power. That's what they're in the business of doing, so that's kind of their angle. But no, we, we did not commission this thing. Any other questions? All right, we've seen this slide maybe at the very first meeting. This was just a view of all the different studies uh, and what they provided. Um, and what you see is most of them are no. Uh, the one that, that's why we're giving this IRP. But most of them had some type of an interest led, you know, an angle that they were coming from. But the RP is to address and change all these nodes to green, and that's the whole purpose of the RP. So we'll have uh, we'll have detailed load forecasting, we'll have a detailed transmission analysis, we'll do a 20, 20 year present net value, we'll evaluate our risk, we'll also we'll have public involvement throughout this whole process, and we'll be evaluating our current future staffing needs. And we'll be doing a sensitivity analysis to ensure the least cost option is identified. So just a summary review of the studies. None of the studies were comprehensive. Right, right to our, our power spot. So they, they all had something like you no know, transmission cost, or whatever. Uh, all the studies were indicative of potential savings that may be possible by generally assuming an annual TBA increase. So there was assumption made that TBA is going to go up a certain percent of the year. Now this whole purpose of the IRP process is to identify these solutions and analyze any risk or opportunities that, that we may have. And that is the completion of the four studies. Any questions before? Go back to the four. One other thing you don't get with TBA is a public utility commission. Um, if and MLTW was separate from TBA, would there be a desire or a plan or expectation that, that a public utility commission would be in place to represent, you know, community interests, et cetera? Most everywhere else around the country, you've got a public utility commission. Because TBA is a governmental entity, you know, the whole structure of it is different from that point of view. I'll turn it up to JT. Yeah, it's a I mean, <laughs> we actually good that Sue is here because I'm on point with Sue. I have an answer, but I, I think Sue would do a better job. I'm sorry, that's a curveball type of question. No, it's a good question. That's why we curved right around Sue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the short answer to that is that you are correct that public utility commissions regulate investor-owned utilities in virtually all states. 
public power utilities are only regulated by uh, public utility commissions in about six or seven states, even outside the TVA footprint. The theory is they're governmental entities, they're locally regulated by their city councils, and therefore they don't have additional regulation at the state level. So that's the short answer. But there are six or seven states where they are. Didn't there used to be something in Tennessee like the Public Service Commission that was disbanded? So, so they're yes. using like yeah. that. Okay, I have that I have not met. There is a public utility commission in Tennessee, okay. but it addresses other issues besides public power. So by statute currently, we are the same for the Sorry. Hopefully everybody can hear me. And, and one thing, too, to keep in mind along that, because this is a great question, I think what we, we've been saying this a lot, we don't want to be redundant, but the purpose when we, as we go through the process of the RFP, the ultimate outcome in terms of what's in the regulatory scope and how that all fits really could end up hinging on ultimately what what's done, right? So there's really not a, today, clear view that, um, that that's unknown. That may be something that gets evolved. As you know, part of Cheryl's role in her working group uh, will be to sort of be engaged with a lot of that legal and regulatory type of uh, stuff that'll, that probably will come out as we go through this process. In some ways, it raises the responsibility of the, ci the city council to another level compared to what it is today. Yeah, the question becomes where your assets are. Do you own assets outside of the, I mean, who knows where this goes, right? So you, you have to think through all of that. But again, Cheryl's, team is going to be looking at, at uh, all of that. Yeah, and we, I mean, we need to keep in mind that the regulatory scheme for the distribution side is different that's from right. the regulatory scheme on the post side, uh, because that's a FERC-regulated activity. Uh, FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We currently do not interact with them because we only have distribution. If we were to get into the supply of the generation and supply, we might have to also be regulated by FERC. Okay, I'm going to let Lonzo come up and introduce our next speaker. Well, we're approaching the home stretch here. I know that uh, we've thrown a lot of information at you throughout the day, and we want to wrap up by giving you uh, an idea of what the IRP process is going to be like. Um, Seth Brown has worked with MLGW for several years, uh, starting back in 2008. And MLGW chose to, uh, or actually was compelled to uh, register with the uh, NERC, which is the North American Electric Reliability Council, and, and the CERC, which is the Southeastern Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, he's been our consultant through all those processes, worked with us through our audits, uh, worked with us with audit preparation, is very well familiar with the, with the uh, transmission system at MLGW and the regulatory compliance requirements that we have to deal with regularly. So uh, we've had great, we have great success with him, with very clean audits, and that rely on his group, and him in particular, on his expertise in many areas when it comes to uh, regulatory compliance. Seth is a graduate of Georgia Tech. He has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and he is a registered professional engineer in Georgia. He has been employed with GDS Associates as a partner and VP of Transmission Services for 17 years. Prior to GDS, he was employed by Oglethorpe Power and Georgia Transmission. His clients include municipal utilities and CR1, electric cooperatives throughout the United States. So I uh, introduce to you Seth Brown, Vice President of GDS. <clears throat> Thank you, Alonzo. Um, Sue Kelly did a great job of uh, teeing up a lot of these um, issues, so I think it's good that in some cases you're going to hear some of the same things <coughs> twice. Um, integrated resource plans, as Sue mentioned, they're roadmaps. And they could be very effective roadmaps. Um, they identify deficiencies and future needs for resources. Um, in traditional IRPs, much like TPA, Pacific Core, Energy, 
other a lot of other large utilities, they're typically having to wrestle with issues like retirement of units due to age, environmental restrictions, or, you know, desires of their uh, consumers to switch fuel uh, sources. MLGW is kind of in a unique situation where they don't have any resources. They don't own any resources. They don't directly contract for any resources. TVA is their sole supplier. So they're basically starting with a clean slate. It's a really very unique situation here in Memphis. Uh, so the RP also identifies types of resources. Um, we put together a portfolio, um, various portfolios to study in this IRP. We look at what's called base load of resources. Um, you also look at intermediate resources and peaking resources. You want to make sure you have enough resources to uh, cover all different low periods during the year. Um, you need to account for things like generation outages, forced outages. Maybe you have a plant that uh, has a component fail in it. Sometimes these plants will be out for extended periods. You have to have enough resources to meet your load under all kinds of contingencies. And it's got to be the right mix of resources. Um, like um, Reggie was talking about um, peaking resources. Very low capital costs, but very inefficient, very expensive to run. You need them to low capital costs, but you only need them there to cover those peak periods. Um, the RRP also provides guidance on the criteria for future decisions. Um, do we want a renewable portfolio? You know, do we want wind? Do we want solar? Do we want storage associated with wind or solar? Um, do we want energy efficiency programs within MLGW? Do we want distributed generation, maybe smaller scale solar installed within the city. Um, there are other demand side management options that may be attractive. So those could also be part of the integrated resource plan. And then of course, the whole goal here is to provide some transparency. Sue hit on that pretty, pretty well. It's got to be a transparent uh, process. You want to be able to inform your stakeholders and your consumers and also you want to be able to get feedback and input from those same stakeholders. They're the rate payers. Um, they deserve to have their voices heard as well. So throughout this process, once it gets started, you're going to see a, a very robust stakeholder engagement program. So well-defined goals lead to well-defined power supply strategies. Um, again, renewable portfolio could be a strategy. We also need to look at ownership versus purchase power. Um, you know, MLGW could undertake the effort to build a power plant, combined cycle plant in Memphis, but maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to put that construction risk on somebody else. Let some other developer come in and build the plant, and you just agree to engage in a purchase power agreement for 20 or 30 years to buy the output, to put the construction risk, the financing risk on them, and you just um, engage in a, in a PTA. You don't have to staff, you don't have all the compliance and, and, and regulations to deal with, you just strictly take the output of the plan. So those are options that you have to weigh as well. Um, fuel diversity, um, that's a good thing. Um, we don't know what natural gas prices may do. You don't want a portfolio of 100% natural gas resources. Right now, you'd be doing great. Natural gas futures are below three dollars right now, and um, you know that could change. That could change rapidly. If you get a new administration in Washington, um, they launch a few new regulations on fracking. Um, that could change. So natural gas could go from three to six dollars, and then your natural gas plan is not looking so good. And you say, well, maybe I should have invested in some. You know, when solar, some storage, maybe it was some, you know, doubtful, but some coal resources. Or maybe modular nuclear. We've got some clients that do have us look at this modular, modular nuclear option. Um, one client of ours, Utah Municipal Group, out in um, Salt Lake City, has partnered with Idaho National Labs. They've gotten some federal assistance there, and they're looking at pushing forward with this modular nuclear uh, option. So it may be something worth looking at. 
Okay, so let's say uh, the objectives of, of an IRP, uh, we want to look at things like generation ownership, uh, we may want to look at adding some renewables, we want to look at having some generation within the city, potentially, because we're concerned, and I, I didn't hear much of this discussed this morning, reliability. I mean, at the end of the day, MLGW's charges to keep the lights on, um, and that's number one. And part of the issue with the Bellafont plan is it represents about half of your minimum load. You know, you have 1,350 megawatts on what we call a single generating shaft. And if your load in, at MLGW is 2,000 megawatts in a particular hour, and you're importing 1,350, and that plant trips offline, you in a world of hurt. You know, it's just too many megawatts to put you know, on one generating shaft. There's way too much risk. That was really not quantified in any of the studies, um, and, but it's something in this IRP that you're going to want to look at. Uh, it's probably better, more reliable to have three 300 megawatt or three 350 megawatt plants than, you know, than a thousand megawatt plant. So that's the type of thing we want to look at. Um, we want to look at short term and long term PPAs. Um, we can go out today. Um, if you're in MISO today, JT is a power marketer. You can say, JT, give me a price for a five year power purchase agreement. I want to buy a block of 100 megawatts from you. I want it 7 by 24. And he'll give me a price good for five years, and we'll ink the deal, and that's done. And you can come up with a strategy where you buy all that block power and you layer it in. You have some peaking blocks and summer blocks and winter blocks. It gets, it gets pretty involved, um, but you can design a power supply strategy that, that includes some of that, and that's what the RFP will, will map out for you. Um, again, we want to look at demand side management and EE alternatives, um, because what does integrated mean in integrated resource plan? Integrated means you're integrating both supply side and demand side resources to come up with a complete power supply portfolio. We want to, we don't have any existing power supply resources. Again, everything right now is, is TBA as a full <coughs> supplier. Uh, but we want to assess the full gamut of the power supply alternatives. We want to look at PPAs. Um, we want to look at traditional thermal generation, solely owned, jointly owned. We want to look at renewables. There could be partnerships involved with other utilities. Uh, you know, there could be a utility that is looking to build a big combined cycle plant. It's economical for them, but maybe they don't need all the output of it for another 10 years, and they got some excess capacity. You can enter into a bilateral arrangement to, to take a piece of that plant, um, either through a PPA or through direct ownership. So those are the types of opportunities that you want to take a look at. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Okay, so we're going to do, in an IRP, we're going to do what's called resource screening. We're going to take a look at a whole bunch of uh, factors, most of them economic. Um, we want to look at the economic feasibility of a resource. We want to look at its locational value. In MISO, and I'm going to get into MISO a little bit here in a minute, um, all resources and load have a locational value. Uh, dependent upon the congestion in the area, how robust the transmission system is, you may not be able to deliver power from your cheapest generator to your load because the transmission line may not support it. You may actually have to dispatch a more expensive unit because locationally it can, it can serve a load. And that's basically what we need to take a look at. We need to take a look at the locational value of, of various resources. We want portfolio diversification. Again, we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. We don't want to go 100% natural gas. Um, you don't want to go 100% coal. From a reliability perspective, you don't want to go 100% solar either. Um, you know, there's risk associated with that. Sun doesn't always shine. And you may not have enough storage capability to store all that um, solar power when you need it. 
Uh, we, we, we want to be conscious of emissions regulations. Um, those are ever changing. Um, you know, under prior administrations, there were the, quite a few new emission regulations came along, mercury, some other uh, carbon regs that really forced most coal plants to be on the path to decommission. Uh, so we want to be conscious of that. Um, again, we want to talk about um, ownership versus power purchase agreements. You may want some of both, and you need to, you need to screen those, those different options. We want to look at renewables versus traditional resources. And also we want to look at transmission interconnection and deliverability. That's not typically part of an integrated resource plan, but if you notice in um, MLGW scope and their RFP, it's a integrated resource plan slash transmission analysis. So whatever options are screened at some final list, we're going to have a robust transmission study done, power flow study, and the consultant is going to come up with some verifiable costs for building those upgrades, whether it's upgrades just to integrate a plan into MLGW service territory, or whether it's to build EHV, extra high voltage connections across the Mississippi River to MISO, or whatever the option requires, that's going to be studied in depth from a transmission perspective through this transmission analysis. So we have some legitimate, verifiable numbers. Because I, an option may look great, you know, just on its own, um, and it may look like it may save you 200 million a year, um, but it may cost a whole lot more in debt service than that to build a 500 kV line 50 miles across into Arkansas. So we need to look at the whole entire picture, which as of today has not yet been done. Fuel transportation and availability. I believe uh, MLGW is in a good space as far as um, natural gas. You're a very large uh, local distribution company. You sell natural gas today. You have some large pipelines, natural gas pipelines in the area. So that is a, a big positive. <clears throat> Financing implications. You know, MLGW can only finance so much. I mean, you only have to take on so much debt service. Um, you know, you have to go out, you have to get rated for these bonds uh, in order to build transmission or generation. And so there are financing implications, you know, of what rate can I get? You know, what, what's the market going to price my bonds at? And so that's got to be looked at. And then again, I can't stress enough reliability. That is, that is key. Um, I looked this morning, I pulled up the MISO webpage, and maybe I can go out there and pull that up. And they have some very nice graphics there. They have a pie chart that shows you for every hour what, what the resource mix is. And this morning, serving the load, I think there's about 40,000 megawatts in the footprint of load in my setup this morning at that particular time. 45% coal, 35% natural gas, 15% nuclear, and about 5% wind and solar. So you can see there's a, there's a diversification of resources even within MISO, and that's about where you want to end up as well. Okay, so to perform this IRP, it's going to take a whole lot of data gathering by the consultant. Um, they're going to have to look at what we call EPC costs, which is the engineering, procurement, and construction costs associated with both generation assets and transmission assets. For plants, we have to look at the summer rate of capacity. Um, it gets pretty hot here in Memphis in the summer, and your, your brand new, sparkling, shiny 1,000 megawatt plant may not put out 1,000 megawatts if the ambient temperature is 98 degrees and the relative humidity is 90%. It's going to get derated, so that's got to be taken into account. Um, we're going to look at a fixed cost and variable cost. We're going to look at the heat rate, how efficient is the unit. I think Rod talked about heat rate is basically how much fuel it takes to generate a kilowatt hour of electricity. So that is very important. We want to look at the cost of fuel and transportation. Um, we're going to have, have different sensitivities based on different fuel cost projections. We're not going to say, make a decision based on the fact that natural gas is $3 today. 
Um, we've got to have some sensitivity to look at various natural gas costs. And then decommissioning costs. You know, we need to take into account if the plant has got a 30 year life, at the end of that 30 years, it's going to cost me money um, to decommission that plant. That has to be factored in. Financing term, emission rates, uh, discount rates. We want to look at levelized fixed charge rate, which is basically the annualized cost of the, of, of, of the fixed cost, primarily the, the debt, cost of capital, taxes. Um, those types of things. Um, we want to look at the projected availability and forced outage rate of a particular technology. Uh, depending on what it is, um, you know, it may not be available all the time. So we have to calculate what we call a capacity factor for this unit. And that kind of forced outage rate, we have to make some assumptions for that to make sure that we, in our model, that we've got the load covered for every hour under every possible contingency. And then lastly, are there ancillary services available from these, these plants? Um, can, can one of these resources help us support voltage in the area? I mean, we may have some large air conditioning loads in the summer. Um, we need to make sure that we can supply those um, with, our, with our resource portfolio. This big pink blob, that's uh, MISO, the Continent Independent System Operator. And that's just a tiny piece of it. <coughs> All this white here is Tennessee Valley Authority. Here's MLGW, right smack in the middle. <laughs> um, so Alonzo asked me to, to, to talk a little bit about MISO and what it is. I know there's some MISO folks in the room. And, Slap me around later if I mess this up. But, but MISO, they're an independent system operator, and they are, their, their primary goal is to, is to keep the lights on, to make sure the grid is reliable and stable. Um, but in addition, they run a market. They run a power market. It's a, what we call a day ahead and real time energy market. Um, every load serving entity that's a market participant in MISO has to supply a load forecast every day to MISO. So on MLGW, if I was a market participant, I would be putting together a load forecast for tomorrow. I would be sending it into MISO. And I would be telling MISO in every hour how many megawatts of load I'm forecasting to have. At the same time, everybody in MISO that owns a generator has what they call a must offer whether it's solar, um, nuclear, fossil fuel, they have a must offer requirement. And they'll offer in basically at their marginal cost every hour to produce X number of megawatts. So MISO has this great big algorithm that takes all these demand bids, <coughs> generator offers, and they look at the system and they see what kind of shape the transmission system and do I have any major transmission lines that are going to be out the next day? And they run this big algorithm, this big engine, and out pops what we call the day ahead awards. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, every market participant will be able to go out to the MISO portal and they'll see, okay, this is the cost to serve my load tomorrow in MISO. There is a locational marginal price posted for me, for MLGW, for every hour. Am I going to pay $20 a megawatt hour, $30 a megawatt hour, $50, $90, depending on what happens, that's when I find out it's 2 o'clock the day of the market. And generators, on the flip side, find out that's what they're going to get paid. And it is all locational price. So what MLGW would pay versus what West Memphis, Arkansas would pay versus Clarksdale, Mississippi. It's all locational based. Again, it depends on the, the state of the transmission system, what kind of congestion there is. So MLGW could be paying a higher price than West Memphis, Arkansas because there's a constraint between the two. So you're just thinking to yourself, my God, this is crazy. I don't know what I'm going to pay for power you know, until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they hit, that's right. And so 
how do you hedge against that? We talked a lot about hedging. Well, my hedge is I got this power plan I offered in. And if it's where my load is, if MISA's telling me, hey, you're going to pay $30 a megawatt hour to us for your load, they're also telling you we're going to pay your generator $30 a megawatt hour to generate. So that's your hedge. Okay? <coughs> you're going to pay the cost of fuel for your unit and the staff and the operations and maintenance and all that. But MISA's going to pay you. So basically what happens is you get a bill from MISA and you got a column of charges for the load and everything else you pay MISA for, but then you get a bill credit for your generation and that gets netted. And so that, that's how MISO works. Um, and the way you hedge yourself, again, one way is you've got resources that you own, that you offer into the market. Or I went and bought 100 megawatts of clock power from the power market or JT. And so JT's obligation for that 100 megawatts is he goes in, he tells MISO, hey, you know, MLGW's load was 1,000 megawatts for that hour, but 100 megawatts of that is my responsibility. We got a power purchase agreement between them. Take that 100 megawatts, take it out of MLGW's account, put it in my account. I'll pay MISO for it, okay? MLGW pays me for the contracted amount. If, if I agree to pay JT $25 a megawatt hour under our agreement, I pay him. If the price, the day ahead price for MISA was 100, he's out 75 bucks for today. But I've hedged myself. I, I, I know what my costs are going to be. So whether it's a PPA or a known power plant, I've got ways to hedge myself against the market prices. Okay. So that, that's what MISO, MISO does. That's, that's basically how it works. You say to yourself, why would I even want to join MISO? Well, because it's an efficient system. All the loads bidding in, all the generators are offering in. MISO is optimizing that whole mix of load and resources and transmission to come out with the least cost dispatch for the system. So over time, being in MISO, you're going to benefit. You're going to enjoy times when there's really low cost power. But there are times when things happen, those prices could spike. They could go into the hundreds or could hit $1,000 a megawatt hour for a short period of time. So you want to be hedged. But overall, the efficiency of the market brings a lot of benefits. OK, so um, as far as modeling this IRP, depending on what tools the consultant uses, there, there's various tools. ProMod is, is kind of the Cadillac of it. Um, there's other ones like Crystal Ball, Market Power. PSSE is a Siemens product. That's what's typically used to model the transmission system and to identify the constraints and come up with the upgrades that are going to be needed as part of this uh, integrated resource plan. OK, so what are our long-term power supply planning goals that we want to follow and want to adhere to through this IRP. We want resource diversity. Uh, they have to be economically feasible. It's got to fit our needs here at, in Memphis. Um, and we want to make sure we account for any congestion risk. We don't want all of our resources located in Arkansas. You know, we're probably going to want some here in Memphis that's in our backyard that we can control and represent a very good hedge for us. We want contract term diversity. I mentioned if you're going to buy power blocks, um, you're going to want some short-term stuff, you're going to want some long-term stuff. Um, same with own resources. You're going to want some base load, some intermediate, and some peaking. You want to optimize that portfolio that, that's best going to meet your needs. Fuel diversity, we don't want to go 100% natural gas, we don't want to go all coal, we don't want to go all nuclear, we're going to want some mixture. And we want to be um, aware of environmental regulations, even the ones that you know are just in the planning stages. Um, and we want diversity of renewables, we want to make sure we've got some goal for, for renewables here. What, what makes sense? What makes sense for, for Memphis? How much wind, how much solar? 
um, that's got to come out through the process and through through stakeholder engagement, and then it's got to bear out <coughs> in, the, uh, in the analysis and the financial analysis. I'm just throwing up. Just uh, these are just some uh, made up um, outputs of some integrated resource plan similar to what GDS has done in the past. Um, and you'll see here's a bunch of scenarios, 11. I will suspect um, that MLGW will have the consultant run many, many more than 11 different scenarios. But we have a business as usual case, whatever that may be. In your case, it's Tennessee Valley Authority, full requirements supply. This is scenario, is block purchase power. Here's scenario, rice, what is rice? Rice is reciprocating internal combustion engines. They're basically these giant uh, diesel engines, similar, similar to what they put on cruise ships. Um, they can be fired on liquid fuel or natural gas fuel. They're efficient, they're very popular, um, but they're small. Um, you're not gonna put um, you know, 200 of them here to serve all of your load, but they're, they're a good option. So you might couple that with a uh, gas turbine, you know, on 2500, and some block purchase power. Here we've got some wind, here we have some solar, we have various combinations, um, we have um, reciprocating engines and a power purchase agreement for wind. Here is straight, unhedged RTO market. It's good to have it as a comparison, but it's basically, like we said, that's an unhedged deal where you're subject to those spot prices every day, way too risky. Um, modular nuclear, modular nuclear with wind. So there's all various <coughs> infinite number of combinations that we come up with. But the key is you're gonna have to set some goals. We start out with this process, what's our target? What do we wanna have as far as a, you know, diversity of fuel? What do we wanna have for renewables? Do we wanna have some demand side management options? You know, what is it that's going to be best fit for MLGW and Memphis? Um, so what comes out of the IRP, um, you'll see some sensitivities. This one had a base fuel, you know, maybe that's $3 natural gas. A high fuel could have been $6 natural gas. And we had this one here we call political fuel. Well, what is that? Well, you may be on the cusp of potentially a new administration coming in, which could you know, either drop regulations, which drops the price, or maybe all of a sudden says, hey, I come in office, I'm gonna ban all fracking, and natural gas prices go through the roof. So we gotta take into account all that. And we end up with a, uh, you know, a 20 year net present value um, in millions, and we boil that down into a dollars per megawatt hour or mills per kilowatt hour rate. Practically, same thing. Here's, here's a, just another version of it. In this case, they use a 3.2%, 3.29% financing rate for self bill. We did it at $3 and $6 gas. They did a self bill, you know, a couple different alternatives here. They also did a couple of full requirements deals. Maybe they had a supplier. Um, offer to come in and serve all their needs for a, for a fixed price. And so you run through all that, what's it going to cost me, and what you're really concerned about is over 20 years, what's my mills per kilowatt hour? 30 years, what's my mills per kilowatt hour? So these are the types of outputs you're going to see from the integrated resource plan. Um, this is overly simplistic, but it gives you a flavor for the types of uh, data that you're going to see flow from, from this effort. And again, you, you'll have a whole lot more than this. If you have many more scenarios, many more alternatives, you're trying to satisfy a lot of different needs here. And of course, we have a question of, of transmission. Transmission, just about for any option that MLGW looks at, will have to be constructed. And it's cost. <coughs> and that has to be factored in as well. That concludes my presentation. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, the city of Memphis is the owner of MLGW. City of Memphis objectives are not exactly the same as MLGW's objectives. We know that from comments made earlier. 
should the IRP consider some Memphis objectives? For example, reduction of pollution, reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, addressing uh, energy burden issues for low-income neighborhoods, creating increased incentives for individuals or neighborhoods to install solar at the local, you know, individual uh, household or community level. A bunch of other objectives that, that are going to be Memphis objectives, not necessarily traditional IRP type objectives, but they should be part of the consideration of the decision making. Oh, and as well as well as obviously business development and promotion objectives. Right. Um, you can set goals um, to meet all kinds of desires. Um, this little future vision here, I mean, what's going to be the vision? I mean, you got to take into account a lot of different factors. Some of the things you mentioned are distributed generation related. Uh, maybe industrial customers, commercial customers that want to engage in that. That could all be factored into an IRP. Maybe it wasn't part of an op typical IRP that you would see 20 years ago, but is much more common today. Um, competitive positioning. Um, you want to be able to make sure that you've got a good environment for industrial commercial development within the city of Memphis. And so this, that has to be one of the goals. You want to have good rates. Now, we didn't say the lowest rate. You want rate stability, right? You want rate stability. Every utility fine I have, it's rate stability. They don't want to have to go for huge rate increases all the time. It needs to be stable, well forecasted, well thought out. And you want to, you want to make sure you have system resiliency. And so, in order to do that, there may be some trade-offs that you look at. Um, well, maybe I don't build as big a transmission line to MISO. Maybe there's some opportunity to put some distributed generation within the city. Is it reasonable for an IRP to include those items I suggested? And, and how would that be decided? That's really between the city of Memphis and, and NLPW board, I guess, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot, like I mentioned, there's going to be a tremendous amount of stakeholder interaction and engagement through this process once it gets started. I mean, they, they are going to be planning for, for quite a bit of input. Um, obviously, you can't meet everybody's goals and objectives, but you have to take a balance of interest. But there will be those opportunities to do those types of things, absolutely. Questions? Would that be and do the ancillary costs such as uh, cooling water access and cooling water costs? Because almost all of these use cooling water. That's right. Right. So if we look at, which definitely will be in many of the scenarios, it's a self build option to put a uh, combined cycle combustion turbine with a heat recovery steam generator. That is the most efficient natural gas generation, and that's what Allen is, right? So, cooling water, water for the hearse, for condensers, all that has to be taken in, into account, just like fuel, absolutely. Want water <coughs> and And MLGW is uniquely positioned, they're the largest three system municipal utility in the country. I mean, they got natural gas, they got water. Uh, they're, they're very uniquely situated to be able to, they're not going to have to go to some water supplier, some natural gas supplier to be able to, to come up with some good good data to put into this IRP. They already have it, they do it every day. where we are in the IRP process and kind of what, what our plans are going forward. So right now, these are the consultants who have responded back to the RFP when we were released several weeks ago. And so our process right now, we will finalize 
tomorrow, scoring and ranking the uh, RFPs and consultants. Next week, experience on Friday, we're going to bring those consultants in house to have a demonstration meeting with our executive staff. This going to be on Thursday and Friday of next week. If that goes well, on the following Monday, uh, the notice to award to the contractor will be presented on the 19th and our next NWW Board of Commissioners meeting. We will offer a resolution to, the, uh, to get that contract signed with the consultant. That will then go to the uh, Memphis City Council for a resolution on July the 2nd, with a war date anticipating July the 9th, project kickoff meeting on the 15th, and at the next PSAC meeting, we would like to have that consultant on board to present their work plan to this committee. And that's again when the work will begin. I think we've done a very good job over these last few years of kind of explaining the process and I think what comes out of this, what we've seen today with the consultants, what Sue's talking about and also said, that we're headed down the right path with the RRP. Because what, you, what we've seen on the four studies, all of them approach it at a different perspective. But the RRP will get us to the point that we need to go. And so this is our timeline and where we're going right now. Any questions for me? Sir? Mike. Now, Seth. His group was not on that list. Is he, as a consultant to MLGW right now, walking us through? Seth and his staff would be a part of the peppers for the evaluation of, but they did not be on the uh, overall RFP. So Seth, you do this stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So again, okay, we'll complete this process tomorrow, and we'll know <clears throat> early next week the consultants who are going to come in do the demonstration to walk us through step by step, what's their work schedule, everything <coughs> is done. Obviously, we're going to have regular interval meetings with the PSAC committee, so we will evaluate all of those next week with those top two candidates before we make a final selection. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. All right, so. In keeping with our prior history, y'all are going to stop believing our end time because we keep finishing. We'll give y'all time back. But we, um, I do want to kind of cover a few things just as we wrap up. Uh, one thing, uh, everybody should have a uh, one-pager uh, at your place there that's a recap of the May the 16th meeting. Make sure you take that with you. That's actually, uh, we'll have one, of course, next time for a recap of this meeting. You also should have um, a uh, American Public Power Association article just for your perusal um, came out recently. So when was this article published? Within the last week. Within the last week, so it's fairly new. But it's really uh, mayors, the title is Mayors Proclaim Pride and Public Power. So it's an um, overview of several mayors across um, the ATPA network. Just a good reading for you around the notion of some of the things that you heard Sue talk about. So I want to make sure everyone um, is, is aware of that. So when we think about where we're headed now, I want to make sure that, um, that everyone is aware now that you've been kind of, we've had the, I call the appetizer. Um, so, so we're going to have some, some real work. And one of the things I wanted to do, rather than give you, I do have a homework assignment, but what I want to make sure that we were going to do it in here, but I don't want to presume upon what I think the consultant may do because we don't know who that will be nor do we know what they're going to ask of you. I think I know some things they may ask uh, up front. But let me, let me suggest to you this. In the interim between now and the next meeting, which is Ju July 23rd, just a reminder, July 23rd, same place, same time, July 23rd, uh, here back at the uh, Ben Hooks Library. And um, that will be the meeting where we will have the, uh, the consultant on board uh, to begin the process. I would expect that you, as the PSAT team, will need to be providing, then uh, uh, beginning to be providing some input uh, into this process. And if I, what, I, what I'd like for you to do is to begin thinking about, you've heard us discuss, certainly you've heard Sue and, and Seth today, talk about priorities that would be important. So if, if, if my encouragement to you is to be thinking of the, the two to three, or the three to five, priorities that you feel will be important from your perspective or from the perspective of those that, that you represent. And you might want to even think about rank ordering those, but I think it will be good to have those come sort of ready um, to discuss. I don't know the format that that will be in. I just think it will be helpful for you to think through what you've heard as we've gone through these first few meetings 
Um, and then think about what you're bringing to the table, what you think will be important for us to consider. It's just like anything else when you, you know, I know the city just went through and, and Doug can relate and, and certainly uh, Commissioner Jones can relate at the county level. Going through budgeting process, you have a lot of requests, you have a lot of things that are being considered. And at the end of the day, you consider all of those things and the ultimate output probably doesn't align with what 100% of those inputs were. But all of that is considered. And in a similar way, we want to make sure we've got all of that input uh, as we go through this process. So be thinking about what are the, what are the, what are the things that, that you think the folks you, you, your stakeholders, folks you represent, your constituencies, or those concerns you have, how do they interplay into what you've now learned about what this process is all about? Um, and also be thinking about any other questions. I'll pause now. Um, and again, we want to sort of take a re, you know, recap. We, we kind of did a lot of basic stuff over the first couple of meetings and then today and delved in a little bit around the IRP process. So um, as you're thinking about things, any questions as you're even beginning to formulate what you want to consider as your priorities, are there any questions or things that you think we need to address or be concerned about uh, as we prep for the July 23rd meeting? And by the way, uh, the July 23rd meeting will be the last, well, we'll have that meeting, no meeting in August. Okay, remember that, no August meeting, and we will plan to pick up a September meeting. Don't, where's, where's Gail, who's, do we have a date for that one yet? September? Just, just want you all to be aware there's no meeting planned for August right now. So July 23rd, no August meeting, and then I think we have a plan for a meeting in September. Of course, we'll keep you all included. I just want to make sure for planning, you all kept that in mind, okay? With that, what uh, thoughts or closing uh, thoughts or considerations should you should we be, be hearing about or thinking about? Anything in particular, Dennis? Uh, it is an announcement. I, I apologize. You can shoot me later. But two weeks from today at 6 p.m. in this room, one of these rooms, MLTW and the City of Memphis are going to be talking to the Sierra Club and answering our questions about this process and about what citizens want and are interested in and, and I'm not going to be poking anybody but I'm going to be asking other people there are going to be yeah. asking some tough questions. Absolutely. So, two sure. weeks from today, uh, 6 p.m. in the evening. Thank okay. you. Okay. September 16th. No. Okay. So, so Dennis's meeting, he's talking June about 20. this two weeks from today is the 20th. Let me be clear now, on the 20th, um, I thought we had a power hour meeting scheduled for June the 20th. You might. Is that? Yeah. Okay, That's so the, his, your meeting is not that meeting. Right. Okay, because I was going to announce the power hour meeting, but I don't want folks to be confused. So just just, just kind of keep it separate. There's your meeting. That's fine. We'll certainly have folks to help with that. But there's also to, there, there's also a scheduled uh, MLGW power hour meeting on the 20th at 6 p.m. at the division office downtown. It is a community meeting, part of a series of community meetings that we're doing not just to talk about this, but to talk about other issues around the MLGW uh, arena. So that's actually on that same same day, but we certainly will be. I'm sorry for the conflict. No, it's fine, we, that's, that's no problem. And then to Gail's point, the September meeting is scheduled for September 16th, place yet to be decided, I think. To be determined. To be determined. So just for planning purposes, for those of you who need to plan out, put a placeholder on your calendar uh, for that, okay? All right, what else we got? Anything else? Look, good input. Thank you for, uh, for being here. And certainly want to make sure that uh, you all know we appreciate you taking the time uh, to do this. And if we can give you back some time, that's always an, an appropriate thing to do. So again, uh, be prepared for our, um, our next meeting. I want to thank Sue Kelly coming in from uh, American Public Power Association, Seth Brown from BDS. helpful you know it's an educational process really for all of us so I think it'll be a great opportunity for us to learn and continue to grow and uh, do best on behalf of our customers so everybody be safe thanks again